Hello, and welcome everybody to another episode of Pod Strickland. And I'm your host, Shwini Poon. And this is episode 283. I am joined on a uh, very, very nice Monday night uh, following the Knicks 137 115 demolition of the Rockets, uh, with complete with an Emmanuel Quickly 40 point masterpiece, uh, really. Uh, but I'm joined, as always, by my co host, Stacy. That is at St- Stacy Patton 89. Stacy, how are you doing? Uh, feeling pretty good in my role, man. Feeling pretty comfortable. <laughs> um, are you are you back? You're back in the uh, back in the states I'm now. Back on the Eastern Time Zone. Yeah. There we go. Look at that. Uh, all right, and we're gonna talk about uh, you being back and watching Knicks basketball at normal times. Uh, but before we get started, I do have to make a few announcements. The first being that the Strickland has. And Instagram. Check that out. That is at the strict.land on Instagram. We are posting all kinds of new content on there. The Strickland also has a YouTube channel where you may be watching this podcast. If you are and you haven't already hit like and then subscribe to the channel, that would be a huge help to us. The Strickland also has merchandise, uh, new merchandise, some of which I'm wearing currently. Uh, check it out. There's all kinds of new stuff on there hoodies, t shirts, hats, fleece shorts. It's all it's all available. There's even a I think there's a there's a RJ Barrett water bottle if you want it. We got all types of shit there. Um, so check that out. Uh, and then finally, the Strickland has a Patreon, which you can subscribe to. There are a number of different tiers. There's a six dollar tier that gets you access to Pod Strickland, this podcast that I host every Friday with Prez. You also get access to the Strickland Mailbag that is hosted by Andrew Steele, aka Doug, aka the Doug Bag, alongside Dallas Amico. You also get access to the Strickland Discord, where the conversation never stops. There are further tiers. There's a $9 tier that gets, that gets you access to Strick and Roll, my solo pod, where I rant and rave about the Knicks even more. You also get access to wonderful weekly premium articles by Matthew Miranda, one of the best in the business. There are further tiers. There's a $15 tier, $30 tier, $50 tier, $100 tier. $100 tier. Those come with a variety of additional benefits, like listening on a pod recordings, merchandise discounts, and even potentially co-hosting a podcast alongside yours truly one day. Whether you choose to subscribe or not, none of this would be possible without you. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, I, I mean, look, I just might as well just get it out of the way. Uh, Knicks are obviously on a three-game losing streak. They had that game in Orlando where Julius and quickly have the little little kerfuffle um this felt like a, this was a must-win game I, I don't like i don't i know people don't like oh like how can you say it was a must-win game they needed this game um they had pissed away what i thought were at least i, I thought it should have you should have been looking to go two and one last week they instead they go oh and three um they needed to get this one against a terrible houston team who by the way that team is a fucking disaster um they are <laughs> terrible um but They got the win, and, I mean, it's not outlandish to say this. Uh, Emmanuel quickly had a historic performance. Um, He scored 40 points on 18 shots, 14 of 18 from the field. Um, It just, he he had it going from day one, or day one, from minute one. And, um, yeah, I I just, there's really not much else to say. He was just absolutely fantastic. and it's one of those things where it's like, you know, uh, Jalen Green, obviously super talented, uh, a prospect that a lot of people loved coming in to the draft. Uh, Kevin Porter Jr., another uh, favorite, I would say, of draft Twitter, um, who, again, he's super talented. I don't know about the mental side of things for him, um, but like he, he just. Like you see, like these all these lottery talents they've amassed, you know, like Jalen Green, Tari Eason. You know, they have Shangun, Shangun who's been was, yeah, put up numbers. You like, can see the fun part of it, but when Mitch decided yeah. he wanted to play, it was, yeah, over. and yeah, Hardstein, and, too. I don't, I don't want to, yeah, yeah. And and I just think, like, I, I don't even, I don't even think this is that much of a hot take. I'm not trading quickly for any of those guys straight up. For God, would you trade him for God? Uh, maybe. Uh, might I heard God has some powers, um, so I might need to consider that. But I think quickly's on God's good side, so uh, I think we're okay there. Um, but like, no, I just I, you watch a game like this, and like, I don't know, maybe it is an overreaction, but I've thought this felt this way for a long time, and um, you know, now what you're seeing is like now that the two point percentage has come up. I mean, he had, what is he? He hit four threes today. Um, 
he only got to the line, I think, what, like six times maybe? Or maybe it was more. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, eight times, it looks like. Um, but, like, he couldn't have scored 40 points like this earlier in his career, like, unless he was super hot from three and hit a bunch of threes. He had five threes today, so it's not like he didn't hit threes, but um, he went eight for eight inside the arc, I think, today. It, it just it was incredible to see. It just felt really easy. Like, I think you're 100% right, but, like, you know, you look at some of the big games he had. You know, he was hitting big threes, um, but a lot of it was, like, kind of making shots where you're like, oh, he's feeling it tonight. That wasn't the feeling I got today. Like, I just felt like he was getting to his spots whenever he wanted. Uh, there was that one possession at the end of the first half, which was objectively a bad possession. Uh, he dribbled around in circles, basically gnashed. He couldn't shake his defender. And then he just took a turnaround fadeaway. And, but it just felt like, you know, there, there was, there were a couple, there was one really that sticks out. There was, he's driving on the break. Um, and he did like what some would call a foul baiting move. He like went into the defender with a step, but you know, everyone else gets away with it. Got the foul, but I was like, okay, it's a foul, but it's going in. Like these were just all makeable shots. And um, you know, I think there were a couple of nicks where it just like it felt like um it felt like the way like last year when quickly played G League, you could tell he really shouldn't be playing G League. He didn't hit his threes, but if you looked at you mean summer league. level, what? Summer league, sorry, know. summer league. That's yeah. what I mean. Uh, summer league, he he looked like it's not um like he's just getting wherever he wants. If he misses the shot, he misses the shot. But it's not very difficult, and that's how it felt tonight. Like it, it at no point did it feel like Emmanuel quickly can't get exactly where he wants to go. Um, when he when the shot wasn't there, he's kicking out. Um, what do you have? Seven, eight assists tonight as well. Nine, uh, nine assists. Um, it did not feel at any point. Like there was anything, the, the, the Rockets are really bad. But that's the point, point, right? It's like they're like bad. it just it looked like he was playing, like it looked he got forty. I don't want to say in a sleep, but yeah, like <laughs> it I didn't mean, look like it was really hard for him. It, I think this is different from the Boston game where he's playing really well. This was just the game where he was just like, I can, like I'm just you're you cannot guard me. There's the game stars have to have games against bad teams where they just shit on them. And like, it's and, not and, and hard. like and th- he was not the only player who that held true for tonight. I think Julius had bouts of bad decision making, but generally whenever Julius Randall wanted to get whenever Julius Randall was like, all right, I'm getting a shot at 10 feet. He got one. Or if he missed, it was usually an open three that he just missed. Um, RJ Barrett. I thought that was true for as well. Like he could get to the, he could get to a layup when he wanted Mitchell Robinson, when he woke up in the second half, like he had that snatch block, which was like, yeah, like, <laughs> you know, like he struggled in the first half, but don't get it twisted. Like Alpern Shangun is not causing me problems. I just, you had some shit going on the first half. Yeah, he, he just, he started off, he was not focused. He was but there not were, focused. And his effort level to start the game, along with, I mean, I, I actually thought in the first half, like quickly and RJ were probably the, the two guys who, I'll throw Hardenstein in there. Yeah, Hardenstein too. Though, really yeah, important, but yeah, um, the, those three were like the only three that I felt like. But good even about even in the first half, Randall wasn't playing well. But Randall, like, I don't. I really don't want to talk about. Like, I don't want to talk about Randall because I quite honestly thought his defensive performance today was atrocious. It was abysmal. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, I thought some of his shot selection was very. But he also looked like a star player on autopilot against the yeah, bad he, team. But and, and that's fine. And so, I'm saying like the point. The point I'm making yeah. on quickly is that quickly looked that way. Now for Randall to look that way, he's an All NBA player. That's how quickly looked. He looked like a guy that's like, <laughs> I don't belong in this game. Like you don't belong on the court with me. That's how I felt watching the Houston Rockets try to defend man quickly or even. Try to score on him. You, know, you get Berlin speed in the half, which I think was a blown switch by Grimes. But um, on both ends, like he's had scoring outbursts before. But I think the sum for me was just how look how easy it looked tonight. Like and um, and that's to your point. That's what you want to see if if you're talking about a star player. And, and it's probably time we started to think about that more. You know, um, is this a is this a potential star? I've said I've always said he's Fred Van Fleet Lowry type, where 
gets on that borderline of elite role player or star, maybe it's time to talk about more. I mean, I will. Kyle Lowry was a perennial all star for what six or seven years. Um, did he really make six or seven all star teams? I'm pretty sure he did. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would not. I don't. I wouldn't want to put that on quickly. Um, because I think I, Lowry, at this point, I don't know why he wouldn't though. Well, I mean, it's not that. I'm just saying, like. I don't think yeah, six time uh, also. Well, good. I don't think talking there. about like getting beyond Kyle like if he's better than Kyle Lowry, then we're talking about like I don't know, like Chris Paul. He's getting his jersey retired. Probably. Yeah, like I, I, I'm not gonna go there, but um like a Kyle Lowry outcome is definitely on the card. I mean, fuck like he could be Jalen Brunson. Like I'm not saying not not the way he plays, they're not gonna be the exact well, same. Impact, but... Yeah, and 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 quite frankly, like I think it's a little bit it, Lowry is the easier comparison because Lowry was never like, you know, a 25 point per game guy or, you know, racking. it's all the little things but, he did. Yeah. It's all the little things. Did. It's, it's the fact that he was a positive defender, that he's a versatile defender. Um, and I think that's where like quickly's impact is always going to be there because, you know, I thought, you don't I mean, think he floats I, on defense. No, I, I mean, I, I do think he does, but I do think that like, I, I quite I, I just don't think people understand like that what he's doing on defense that is the fucking scheme. Like he's pretty much always playing the scheme. Are there times where at his own discretion he might help a little bit more than he should or you know, yeah, of course. But like generally speaking, the mistakes he's making are are mistakes that get exposed because of a team, you know, executing well against what we're trying to do. So it's, it's like, like, for example, the difference between him and say Grimes, who I think is a really good defender. Um, but I, I don't think he's at the level quickly is at right now defensively is, um, that basket that Houston got right before halftime. So they ran like a guard guard screen. I think it was KPJ and Jalen green and, um, Grimes like quickly and Grimes, Grimes is switching there, but he just, he kind of like got caught falling asleep and KPJ just broke through that. Like he went right by him and, you know, Mitch had to foul him and it was an and one and Mitch was unhappy about it. But like, I rarely see quick, just get burned like that in a situation where you just, and, should I, I think, a, and again, a straight I think line that, was, that was a grime. I think Grimes is supposed to switch there. Right. Cause you yeah, saw that's my point. Right. That's my point. To the screen. Yeah. 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 And and so my point is like, I, I don't know what, what exactly Grimes? I think I think there. KPJ just made a great move. Like, yeah, and it, it's possible. Ready for the switch and the, the, it's, sometimes it's, it happens, right? It's possible, but I, I think he got burned. Really, like, you can't get burned like that in that situation. If you're gonna make, if he's gonna beat you, you have to make him go outside of you, not fucking yeah. straight. You have down to. The you can't give up the middle. Like, yeah. If it was uh, D Way to be one thing, but yeah, it's yeah. not. Yeah, and, and I just think like, yeah, I mean, quickly is just he's playing at a super high level, and um, you know, after today. He's played 75 games. Uh, he is at uh, 57.6 true shooting, 53.4 EFG, uh, 19 and a half usage. It's kind of funny. I don't, know, I don't think, are those updated with tonight? I don't think they yeah, are. That's, 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 for, okay. that's NBA.com's updated for today. And he's only missed one game this year. This is 75 games played. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, he's just playing at a really high level. And I think the nice thing to see today, too, was like when he does get his scoring going, um, and then teams have to start, you know, really paying attention to him. You saw him diming up shooters. I mean, he, I thought he actually passed well, really well in the first half too. But guys just didn't cash out, cash out on his on, on the passes they were getting from him. This is something that someone brought up on Twitter. I forget who it was, um, where he is very good at making reads that he can generate that are pretty simple because he he has legitimate paint gravity now, which is not something that we would have said. Um, his rookie year. Um, do you think that the next step is maybe like some of the wow passes? He doesn't make a lot of wow passes. He doesn't need to at this point. But if he could kind of add some of those, right, the one-handed live dribble, you know, to the opposite corner stuff. Um, I mean, that pass that's shit next... comes real easy to a true hooper like this. <laughs> um, but like the why, I think that's really all that's left. Right, in his yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I still think... And actually, the one pass Tom Piccolo tweeted mentioned this at the time, um, in in the game today. But like he had a pass for an RJ three at the end of the first half, that was like he was driving to his left in a pick and roll, and he made a live dribble pass, like a live dribble pass, 
back over his head to RJ for the kick out three. And like that offhand stuff for him, I think that's that I don't care the wow passing shit. Like who cares? Like uh, that's, I'm, I'm lumping yeah. that in, I think. Yeah. But. I just think like offhand ball handling, whatever. Um, I, I think that's probably the biggest one. And then maybe I, I, I know this is a very, very weird one in dimension, but like, I would like to see him get more comfortable taking mid range pull-ups that don't come after he spins back. Like yeah, a lot true. of he, he, I very rarely see him dribble into and just pull up for a mid range shot. Usually he, or like he, he has a sidestep for mid range, but he yeah. usually misses that. That's like, you know, he needs more work on that. I think. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the, those are the things offensively for me that I'm like, that's where there's a little bit more for him to go. But I mean, honestly, like, We'll we'll talk about RJ Barrett later, um, but like, I think whatever your thoughts are about Barrett or Grimes or Obi or Deuce or whatever, whoever the fuck else on this team, the young guys anyway. Um, as far as like development, I mean, he his his arc is basically like it's every single year he's added a little bit more, added a little bit more, added a little bit more, and now what you're seeing is like that microwave score that like kind of like when he first came in the league and we were like holy shit like every time he pulled up from three it was like this shit's going in and the garden's gonna go fucking crazy um and it's like he still has that in him but there's so much more there like that's just the foundation now and he's added so much more to his game right like you talked about the paint finishing that's there um obviously i think he's actually gotten better at drawing fouls because he's doing it in more crafty ways um, I don't think he's just like wildly launching himself into people, which is kind of what he did initially. Um, no, he's, then, he's creating advantages and leveraging them, which is, yeah, that's, that's but, and, and like, as like people can, you know, like um, DJ, a uh, friend of the pod said, you know, one of the fellows were, you know, quickly got an end one, but he kind of went into the defender and he was like, you know, I, I think we should remove this stuff. And I'm like, honestly, like he had a step on the defender and the defender was helpless. And he made sure he got the foul called, but he was also in position to make the layup. Like, you know, you can get mad about that, but in terms of like the foul baiting, like Jalen Green was a lot more guilty of that. Um, but I mean, like the thing I keep coming back, like he dropped 40 and it looked easy, man, against an NBA team. Like it looked easy. I don't think I like even last year when he was playing against, you know, like the Raptors and stuff, you know, teams where it was maybe not. You know, he had the triple double against the Raptors. It still looked like he was going pretty hard. It didn't seem like he had to do much tonight to like go into his bag or whatever. Like it, it looked easy. That's fucking say. <laughs> Which like, if you could, you got a guy that can drop forty when it's easy. The guys who can do that are like named, you know, names like Anthony Edwards or Devin Booker or stuff like that. Uh, which I'm not saying he's on that level, but eye-opening it, it, that was the most eye-opening i've seen him score a lot i haven't seen him score a lot like this and it just looked like every time he gets the ball like i just know he's gonna get a good shot and they make it yeah i mean it's just it, it, again like his development i mean you talk about offensively defensively across the board his one dribble pull up his two yeah. dribble pull up who he is at the elbow yeah he's but he actually is somebody at the elbow now like he can actually fucking yeah the mid range was like tonight was the full culmination but it, it's been there all season and yeah like, and, and then and like you can see like his physical strength has given him more like he's he's confident now in his body and i think like at the start of the year he was almost overdoing it because i think he was like you know he had gotten bigger over the summer Obviously, last year he closed the year so well, and he he obviously made it a point to like you know I want to work on scoring inside the arc right in the paint be better. And I thought he was really struggling to find the balance there. Um, but yeah, I mean since December, I mean really since like that rotation change, but even a little bit before that, I thought he he was starting to turn it around. And I mean since then he's just been fucking nails the entire way basically. I mean and, and I think the difference like I think what's great with him is when he's had a couple of bad games in a row, right? Like he had that terrible game against Sacramento. Uh, he had, and before that he had a bad game against Charlotte and then he bounces back, right? He has a good game against the Clippers. He has a good game against Lakers. He balls out against Portland. And then it's like that last week, right? He really struggled in the Miami game, right? He, that he, Boston game really took a lot out of him. I yeah. Think. And like, yeah. You know, even but he, like he bounced back a little bit, like, yeah, but like, was, but like the, the Miami game was not great. Um, and then the Orlando game, he gets off to a rough start. 
but he like there's something to be said of like when you get off to a shit and he finished with what 25 yeah. and 7 on like yeah. 17, 17 shots yeah and it's like that that ability to to persevere through a bad start and just find a way to help like one turn things around individually but also doing it while helping your team get back into the game um that just says a lot about him and i think like where i feel like rj's really struggling this year is when the shot's not going for him it really impacts his effort in everything else on the floor um and decision making like we see this at times too right when he gets off to a bad start shooting he is trying to force up shots and he's not making the right reads. Um, and I thought actually like, you know, to, to switch base here a little bit, but yeah, I mean, look, Emmanuel Quick is awesome. We could talk about him forever. Uh, this was an awesome, like this was again, a historic performance from him. Uh, and he was one more thing that was related yeah. to him. Also, this is, um, I was once that like, you know, the, the conversation about Julius Randall's getting texts or, you know, outbursts is fair. But like everyone was trying to make it into like, oh, is he beefing with quickly now? There was one possession where um, he quickly ran a pick and roll. He got a switch with Randall, and um, you know he fed Randall at like the free throw line, which they always do, right? If they get the switch, that's kind of the the telegraphed play. And then Randall added, and quickly was just spacing, and Randall like very animatedly called for him to get the ball. Quickly was hot, you know, whatever. Um, but, um, but quickly got the ball, ended up driving, kicking, getting it to Grimes for a three, but it was like, yeah, like they're not beefing. <laughs> like I, I'm pretty sure the vibes are good in the locker room. I'm sure people would like Randall to control himself a little bit better, but like, I think to me that spoke volumes about like the fact that he's like, if you, if you're trying to manufacture some beef between those two guys or like, oh, quickly he's going to sign somewhere else because Julius Randall was mean to him. Like, you know, that play kind of. Yeah, I mean, a lot of cold water on that. I will say that. Um, so I, I don't. Uh, yeah, the the whole thing of like, will this make quickly sign somewhere else or whatever? That that shit's stupid. Like, first of all, no team is going to be like, well, quickly and Randall aren't getting along, so we're actually just going to trade quickly now because, like, him and Julius aren't best friends. Like, that's idiotic. That, like, quickly's playing at a way his level is too high right now to make decisions like that. Um, so that's that, that's just dumb. I don't think that matters. Uh, I I thought the vibes were a little weird tonight, to be honest, between them. Um, not that it was like toxic, but like at the start of the game, I mean, I look, I, I think IQ was fucking locked in today. Like he was not, this is not like prancing around and all that version. This was like he was locked the fuck like in LeBron today. with the face. Yeah, <laughs> the no, he was he was game. but he was really fucking into the game today. He was very intense from the start of the game. Um, and I thought that was like the noticeable difference between him and RJ, to be fair, versus like the other dudes in that starting lineup who kind of were like not there just initially. But um, I thought he was really locked in. And I thought like some of the stuff with him and Randall, it didn't look like they were I don't want to say they're like beefing because I don't I don't really believe that. But I do think there was like there was a lot of not like I don't even know. I don't know. I don't even know exactly how to put it, but it was like it was, it was like frosty. and Polly a little bit after. Yeah, uh... yeah it's a, it was a little frosty. Let's put it that way. It's a little frosty. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't know if I saw that. I'd have to go back and watch. But yeah, I mean, I, I again, I don't think it's like a huge deal. And look, when you have a fucking incident like that, like maybe it it, it can take like a few fucking days, right? Um, for everyone just to kind of move on, and um, you know, look like quickly said all the right things publicly. I will say I didn't love Julius's answer today when he was asked about it. I thought that was kind of like doesn't seem how, like the most comfortable guy in front of a camera. Yeah, but it's just like how hard is it to just be like yeah, you know, like I probably didn't handle that the right way, but that's something that we're going to deal with internally and we talked about. Like what just a better way to answer it than what he ended up saying, which was basically like he didn't really admit that he did anything wrong. And then he was just like, we're going to talk about it as a team. Again, I don't really want to harp on this stuff. I just didn't love that answer from him. And I thought that some of the stuff between them tonight was a little frosty, but I agree with you. It was really good to see in that third quarter that when quick did have it going, Randall made it a point to get him the ball. He did it a couple of times in a row, actually. Um, I thought that was really good to see. And then, um, you know, at the end of the game, he gets his 40 piece, goes over to the bench. Everybody gets up, high fives him. And you could see like, like the guys, obviously, like a very like, like a love teammate. Like all these guys are super happy for him. Um, and RJ, like who, like you know, he he had a pretty solid game today. And actually, I I would take 
I would take this version of RJ all the fucking time. I, I thought he played a really solid game. Not spectacular, not amazing, but just solid. I thought he made good decisions pretty consistently. I liked he his had like one or two rim. bad closeouts. I thought his defense was generally pretty good. Yeah, I thought he was like pretty locked in on defense. Like, like because you can of live with you can end. live with bad closeouts if that's like the yeah if that's what it is. Like if if that's the one thing we're worried about here, then that feels like okay, that's a pretty solid defensive game for him. He, you know, I don't need him to be a lockdown guy. I just need him not to make like huge fucking mistakes that, and then give no effort. And I thought he did a good job today. I thought there was one possession uh, at the end of the first half, especially that I thought was really good um, where he really har- harassed Jalen green around a couple of screens, but like, um, and, and when they broke it open, it was, it was not, it was him. Yeah. He was um, on the floor for that. He was, he was, but he was also, they charged him with a unit that was, I think it was deuce. Uh, quickly and Randall were both on the bench, so he was the. It was Deuce, like the second option on that unit was Hart. So it was Deuce, Hart, Hartenstein, and um, um, the, the fourth is escaping me. Oh, Obi, uh, and Obi's just um, you know, besides garbage time tonight, um, he's in a funk. But it was RJ really had, to, and so like yeah, I, I remember on Twitter like RJ took a step back three. And everyone was like, "Oh, I don't." But like, that was a grenade. That yeah, that got. was a that, that and, was and a they grenade. Were sitting on the drive, yeah. like I'm not going to blame him for that shot. Like he's he's got to take it. If he's sitting on it, I didn't expect it to go. In, but you know that's not really his fault. Um, but he just manufactured buckets. I thought he did a great job of using Hardenstein as kind of a backboard and and using him as an obstacle when he couldn't just beat his man one on one. I think that's a that's a real area of growth for RJ because you know he's not a he's not a blow by guy for you know fast defenders and, and as flawed as the Rockets defenders are, they are athletic. So um what him you know he, he like like quickly he was very good at you know making getting obstacles in the way, getting different angles and, and making sure you end up as a layup or or drawing defenders. And like there were very few times where I like I remember his first drive of the game, I thought it was a beat late. Um like he drove and where he picked it out, he gathered and then he was on the sideline, and he kind of had to throw a little bit of a desperation pass, but he had really and it was an open three and quickly made it. And that was probably his worst beat of the night. Like, the rest of it, like, was on time, on point. Um, he had, like, another turnover where he got massively hacked, which, you know, I, I did think the officiating for large parts of this game was bad. Um, maybe that's yeah, they got a real they got, they got a really good whistle, I thought. Dude, fucking they... They acted like Jalen Green was Michael Jordan, bro. Calm yeah, down. Like you just run into dudes. It was a little bit like the Siakam stuff. Um, I thought the whistle was bad. Uh, the Knicks won. Knicks had a almost a forty point lead at one point, so that's good to see. Um, but uh, like the first half, RJ had an amazing game. Cooled down a little bit in the third quarter, uh, and, and and kind of quickly and and to a lesser extent, Randall took over. Um, but I, I thought that if you get this version of RJ Barrett, like, and, and I think I, I mentioned this today, it's going like RJ, you know, whatever your thoughts, I know there's a lot of people down on him. I know there's people who think he's done nothing wrong this year and he's been great. Whatever your thoughts on him, like this Cleveland's like, if they do play Cleveland, um, that is their weakness right now. People are saying, well, they, you know, Cleveland might match up Donald Mitchell on them. They might, you know, cross match, put Coro on, uh, Brunson, whatever, whatever it is, you know, the Knicks, the Knicks guards are probably as good as quickly as, as good as Grimes is, as good as Brunson has been. The, the Cavs have a little more firepower at the guard position. Um, and they have a little more, you know, they have two great bigs. Um, you know, that'll be a great matchup where the Knicks really have an advantage is if RJ can be the guy can be this guy, the way he was tonight. Like he's a better player than Levert and Okoro. And that's where he could really tilt a series like that. And like he has the ability, however they deploy him, right? I, I think it's fascinating. Are they going to deploy him on, are they going to have a matchup with Donovan Mitchell or Darius Garland? Um, or, you know, do they use them kind of the way that the Spurs often used Kawhi, which is as a free safety? Uh, a little bit of both, maybe, you know, switching. Uh, so on defense, he's capable of that impact. And on offense, like, you know, not necessarily isoing against the guy like Bakoro, but of course a big dude. Let's see how if he can like when they run RJ off these curls, when they get him the ball in motion, he's really tough to stop getting downhill. And like the, the kind of guy that 
can do that is like a, a McDaniels or a Claxton or like, or like a Franz Wagner. Like we've made a lot about his game against Orlando, but Franz Wagner is kind of the prototypical defender to stop RJ Barrett. A guy like Okoro, as great as he is, <coughs> is going to struggle with those kind of actions. Uh, and Lavert just isn't a great defender to begin with. So um, he really has the potential to change that series if that happened. And, um, and, you know, if tonight's tonight's a great step to prove that, um, you know, that it's, it's in there. Um, yeah. I mean, the RJ conversation, like I've had like multiple people being like, how can you say he's empty stats? Like, I'm so, like, Oh, I didn't say 40. that. By the way, I know that you didn't. I, I it's like, I've been like, Oh, you're shooting 44. I had somebody fucking at me today. and was like, Oh, yeah, just can asking we, is, can, can we just not fucking use raw field goal percentage? Yeah, but he, 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 he was like, Oh, like, is is in his canter was fifty one percent field goal percentage? Was 20, he a better? Is <laughs> was he a better offensive player than Jokic or whatever? Or? Is is twenty points per game on forty four percent from the field empty stats? And it's like, do you want an honest answer? Like the answer is based on how he's played this year. Fucking yes. Like, like, and it, it's not. It doesn't give me joy to like shit on RJ. Like I fucking. After his second year in the league, you can go find podcasts. You can hire right? him to me. You so. you can you can go find me on a fucking multiple podcast. Start calling him first ballot, okay? Like saying that they were gonna hang his fucking number in the rafters. So like this is like I have people are like oh you're switched up, bro. Like what are we fucking talking about here? Switched up? Yeah, my evaluation of him has changed based on his performance this season. Like I was as high on him after his second year or his third year as anybody. I mean, there are obviously people that had much higher uh, evaluations of him than me, but I, I love, I mean, I, I praised him last year for how he handled what I thought was a pretty miserable season, miserably coached by a miserable man in Tom Thibodeau last season. Um, and I thought RJ handled that well. And I thought he handled the pressure of like having to step up and really do a lot of the, the, the media obligation stuff because Julius was, you know, fucking hiding in his cave or something. Uh, like, you know, I, I thought he stepped out. He handled all that impeccably. He deserved credit. I was happy when they extended him. I thought that deal was a fucking steal. Like, I thought that was like, wow, this is a great deal for the Knicks. Well, fantastic. Um, and yeah, you can tell me that like, he's just, this is what happens with a developing player. And like, you know, it's understandable. He's took it, you know, he's struggling, but we've seen enough that we can believe in the upside. I understand all of that. But like you can't fucking tell me he's played well this season. And if you do, like, if you want, if you think RJ Barrett is going to be this fucking awesome player, and he, he has the potential to be this awesome player, then hold him to that standard. Like, I don't understand how you can watch the guy we're, that has played for most of the season and be like, "Yep, he's on track. This is exactly what I expected." Give me a fucking break. The guy has played better. Like, the, and this is what makes this extremely frustrating, right? Because we've I've talked about this multiple times on here. I do think he has improved his skill level. Like he is scoring better inside the arc. You know, that's not an insignificant improvement. The problem is his defense has fallen, fell off, a, has fallen off a cliff, you know, and it's been better since the all-star break. But if you go and just sort the Knicks on off on court ratings since all-star break, guess who's down at the bottom? Like, like it's been better. It's not where it needs to be. It's not nearly as good as it was two years ago. It's not as good as it was, last year even and last year he he took a noticeable step um back defensively i thought but like i was fine with that because he was on 30 usage he's handling all this other shit i'm like okay like that's an understandable okay he he'll figure that out but this year it's like he's not doing as much offensively because they have a jalen brunson they have julius randall who's gotten back to playing like an all-star and you know you have the improvement of a guy like emmanuel quickly um who who's developed into a better shot creator than he was last year and it's like he he's rj's getting to play a little bit more off ball he's getting better shot quality and like if you want to tell me that he needs more on ball reps to be the best version of himself that's fine but you got to understand that what that means is that you're taking reps away from guys who are right now better offensive players than him like brunson is a better offensive player than him today not close Julius Randle is a better offensive player than him today. Not close. Emmanuel Quickly is a better offensive player than him today, and I don't think that's close either. And it's like, like if you, if so, this, yeah, it's just like you, you, there's all these excuses and there's all these reasons. I'm not going to say excuses, actually. That's probably the wrong one. But there's all this gymnastics going around about like why RJ struck. And it's like, instead of just being like, yeah, I believe in the dude's talent, but he's not having a good season. And like, it's okay to say that. Like, it's, it's ridiculous to me 
to claim that he's not having like that he's having a good season this year. Like, forget like if if this was if this was like Tyler Hero putting up the same numbers, having the same type of season, the same type of you know, oh my, like these stretches defensively, we were like, what the fuck is going on with this guy? Do you think any Knicks fan would be like, well, he's just a developing player and it's hard because he's playing alongside Jimmy Butler and he doesn't get to handle the ball? Like, no, nobody would be fucking saying that. We'd be getting jokes off click crazy. So to me, like, I still don't think the Knicks should trade RJ Barrett. I want the Knicks to keep RJ Barrett because I don't, one, you're trading him at his absolute lowest value. So what the fuck is the point of that? Two, I still think like he's 22. I'm sorry. Like, I still think there are so many. I mean, we saw it today, right? He had what? He had six assists today. Um, and it wasn't even just the assists. I mean, he had a pass in the first half. He had five assists today, but he had a pass in the first half that he drove, got into the middle of the paint, hit Grimes in the corner, forced the rotation. Grimes swung it to quickly, quickly cans a three. But it's like those like are cleanest possessions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that, those are the, plays to me that I'm like, this is the difference for you. Like if you make those plays and those become consistent, like now you're talking about a guy who isn't just a scorer, but is helping your offense by getting other guys involved and, and, and shifting the defense and putting them into rotation because of his passing ability. And like that, that, and it, naturally it will improve his scoring efficiency too, because he will not be taking as many forced up, junked up shots in the paint. Um, because he'll be making better reads like that. That's, that's not, it's still there. Like there's still a possibility for him to, to really find that balance. And that's, that's proper. pretty easy, low hanging fruit. I'm just saying like, you know, but it just, it has, denying, but like, it, you got no, teams it, inventing stats, right? Well, if you look at it as per touch, then uh, it's like, well, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Cause it's like, if you believe in him this much, then you should be comfortable just being like, he, like if you believe in him this much, then don't you shouldn't you like expect more from him? You know, like like I believe in Emmanuel quickly. Like I, I was saying last year at the end of last year, I think he was our best prospect. Um, he got up to a rough start offensively. The reason I never really doubted him was like I was like, okay, the defense is still great, the effort is still great. He's clearly improved as a ball handler, he's clearly improved in these these micro skills, and I think in time that offense is gonna pop. And guess what? It has popped, right? The difference with RJ Barrett is like I do think he's made improvements in micro skills, but I'm still waiting on that like light bulb goes off. And in, in the meantime, he's not controlling the things that he can control. And then you also have these weird games where it looks like he can't fucking move. And you're like, like you're 22 years old. How is it that you have these games where you just like look like you're absolutely stuck in mud? And quite, and I'll just say this: like I I think I still think RJ Barrett can get to me there's for him to be a solid starting two-way wing is not hard like that that should be where he's at at minimum and all i think he really needs to just hit that level is one i think he needs to seriously like i think he needs the offseason maybe and just like really like think about the season you just had and what like if you're fo hit, I feel like his focus right now is so much on scoring that it impacts other elements of his game, but it's like, you have to control the things you can control. Right. And I think part of that is he is not in the type of elite physical condition that he was in his first and second year in the league. To be honest, I think he's bulked up too much. I don't think he's fat by the way. I just don't think he's, I think he's gotten too big. Probably he's gotten, to the point. Yeah. Like it might be muscle, but it's slowing him down. Yeah. It's slowing him down. I don't think he looks as shifty. I mean, I, I don't not. I don't think he isn't like he just isn't a shifty. Um, everything looks like so. Like you know, he unless he's like driving in transition with you know real like a run ahead of steam. Like I don't trust this guy to just like get to the rim and fucking yam on somebody. You know, like like not. And he was never the highest flyer in the world, but there was a there was more of that. Um, his first couple of years, even last year, and it's like like today, I, probably my favorite play of his other than that sequence I outlined earlier was he cut uh, like Randall had the ball and he, and RJ caught it on the move. He was a cut. And then he just fucking, you know, went straight down and yammed it. And it's like, and that was in a half court, right? Like that was probably my favorite play. Cause I'm like, okay. So like, that's, that's still there. Like it's still there in him. Um, I just, it, it's sometimes it happens like this, you know, like 
sometimes guys have terrible fucking seasons and it's a wake up call and they make changes and then voila, like they become the player you thought they were going to become. Um, but like, it's not to me, it's honestly just ridiculous that there are people that are like, the season is fine. Like really this season is fine for him. Like if this season is fine for him, I just think your standard for him is too low. And that, and that actually is an insult to his talent level. Like, we should expect more from RJ because he has the ability to be more and do more and do it consistently. Like we've seen the flashes this year for sure. And that's why I still believe that like that player can become like that, that he can become that player, right? Like we've seen, like he had a stretch in December where he looked great that entire month. That was probably the best month I think of his career. Um, Cause the defense came around and his offensively, he was fucking cooking guys. That was the gate. That was the month he had what 44 on uh on Chicago, like he he had a really nice stretch there, and then he hurts his finger against Dallas, and it's like, I don't know what the hell happened, but he just looked a lot slower when he came back. We still get these games every now and then, right? Like that Toronto game where he dunks on Scotty Barnes at the end of the game. Like he has these games where you still see that is there, but it's like I need to see that consistently again, and I need to see him make those second and third rotations on defense consistently again. I need to see him play with like that fucking desire. Like the, the, like that, that desire that he had, I really like, I mean, that was kind of like one of his selling points, right? He's like, yeah, he's not the most gifted guy. He's not the, but he just fucking wants it. Like he, he fucking wants it. And that guy this year, the guy that we've seen, hey, he's not wanted it nearly enough, not on, not consistently and not nearly enough. And that's disappointing. And if you have a problem with me saying that, or you have a problem with people pointing out that like every fucking impact metric that exists shows him as the worst player in the Knicks rotation, then you're just being protective of him for no reason. Like we, I, I, I want RJ to be awesome. I love RJ. I think like, I actually wanted to mention this and, and I'm happy I get to now. Like I thought the way he answered the questions he was asked about Julius today um, or whatever it was yesterday or before the game, whatever it was, I like, I thought he answered those impeccably well. And it's like, that's the, that, that stuff to me does matter because it's like, you're in New York, you're in the biggest media market in the world. You're in, you know, probably a team that's covered more irrationally than any other team in the market. Um, and it's like, and in the fucking league, to be honest, like you need guys that can handle that media pressure and he can, and he handled that question really well. And I thought he spoke well. And like that, that does matter. That, that counts for something. But like, I need the whole package. Like, we need we need to see all of it. We know it's there. We've seen the flashes. We need to see that consistently again. And I promise you, if he starts doing that consistently again, like again, the guy like he didn't have some fucking amazing game tonight, right? It was nineteen points, five assists, three rebounds. But who fucked the stats? Like the guy that played tonight, you can win a lot of fucking basketball games with that guy. That guy, that guy helps you win ball games. He helps you. And he would he turn helps the tide you. of the series like the. The Cavs, yeah. even the Bucks, were the Knicks are evenly. That's the thing. If the Knicks played the Bucks, I think they have no hope because the Knicks are outmatched oh, yeah, yeah. of their two best players. Right? Sorry, at the <coughs> the the Knicks' two best players are their point guard and their power forward. Right? The Bucks have an, a crazy defender to say nothing about the other end at power forward. <coughs> Same thing about point guard. If you had a wing, if RJ really became that dude. That can make that series a little bit more interesting, right? It can make yeah. the Cavs series a little bit more interesting. So, I mean, I think I think the Cavs were just we weirdly match up with them very well, like with, and that's we whether do, RJ but like plays a lot well of those not. are going to cancel each other out, right? Like, I would imagine Brunson <coughs> and one of the guards are going to cancel each other out. Grimes is a good defender, but ultimately at this point, I would imagine if he's on Donovan Mitchell, Donovan Mitchell is going to win that matchup. Um. And with the bigs, I think Randall will get his against Mobley, especially if he doesn't have to create on his own, but it's going to be tough. And Mobley will get his fair share back. And Mitch against Jared Allen is probably a wash. So, like, you know, the real dip, like, those are probably, we match up well with them, but that those are probably going to be a wash. Um, <laughs> you know, assuming our guys don't have any implosions. Our just kind of the X factor there, right? And so is our bench. That's not to say that our bench isn't, but. Uh, but with among the starters, RJ really feels like the X factor there, or, or the guy that can you know tip the scales one way or the other. Because I think you know what you're getting from everybody else. Um, <coughs> yeah, no, I I agree with that, and I just I just wanted to talk about that because like I just don't really understand this idea that like 
I, I'm it's ridiculous for me. Like, I'm sorry, like if you take umbrage at calling it empty stats, if you've if you have a problem with that, I don't really give a shit. Like, that's totally missing the point. The point is he has not been a driving factor in the Knicks' success this season. That's a fucking fact. And if you don't see that and you want to coddle him and you want to fucking make all these fucking excuses for why it's not his fault and it's, oh, Julius, you know, he's fucking mean and he gets the ball too much and Jalen Brunson gets the ball too much and quickly gets the ball too much and that he's too off ball. Like, guess what, dude? To be a fucking winning team in this league, you need stars and you need stars that can play off of each other. And if RJ Barrett struggles to play off of Jalen Brunson, like, what the fuck are we talking about here? Like, I'm sorry. Like, you have to be able to play off of these guys. That's a fact. Like, this, and this is, you know, I, I want to bring this up too because, like, Julius Randle has had a very nice season. Um, but I still worry about, like, hey, like, if you went and got a guy, like, you know, we talked about this on the last pod where we nearly killed each other. Um, but, like, if you went and got a Ju- Joel Embiid, like, I'm sorry. I just don't think that fit is good. And I, I know that he's shooting threes at a higher volume or whatever. I still don't think he plays like an off ball player. Like he's still, I don't, I don't know exactly how to phrase it, but like, there's a difference between how you watch a guy like Quentin Grimes play off ball versus a guy like Julius Randle. And, um, the thing with RJ, yeah, Barrett, I right, saw that a lot today though. Like that's, it's not, yeah, he, it is definitely very different, but like he, he is hunting those off ball threes. You can see that a lot today playing off quickly on the drives. He does. He, know, he's, he's, he's trying he's to get better at it. Threes. He's he's gotten better at it, but I still think he's a guy. Like he's who, never gonna be JJ Redick, but like right. I think moving, relocating, f- hunting those shots, like understanding spacing as opposed to I'm a six nine, two sixty pound wrecking ball, give me the fucking ball, which in all fairness, he's dominant in that role. Like he has, I think, changed a lot um in that sense. But I agree. I mean, I I'll tell you, I think that um while I would not have given up the price that Dallas did for Kyrie Irving, uh, it does look like there's something toxic about Kyrie on there. Um, though I still, I, I don't think that's an apt comparison to to Embiid, but it's it's a fair point in terms of fit. Um, you know, let me kind of throw it back to you on this, unless there was more you wanted to touch on with RJ. I think we're pretty aligned here. I think he has an opportunity to do great stuff in the playoffs. Um, I'm more encouraged by the growth in in within the arc. I think you can both admit that, like, if you're looking at his development, like this year has had a lot of encouragement in terms of his footwork and, and finishing. While also saying he hasn't been a great, like a, a plus player. I don't think that's unfair, like to have both those opinions. <laughs> Moving forward, um, you know what the Knicks do this off season is going to be pretty uh, pretty interesting. Um, you know, if you were to, um, you know, let me ask you this. So if, if there were stars available that you could replace RJ Barrett with in the lineup, right? Anyone who's available. Is there anyone that comes to mind right now for you? Or especially um, we didn't have to give up too many picks. No, I mean, I, I don't, it would be a wing, but I don't really have a strong thought on who it is. I like, I don't so we we bring up OG Ananobi. I don't really love OG Ananobi. I do get like, like I still think the Knicks need somebody with a higher offensive ceiling than just a guy like OG Ananobi. And I'll say that I'll, I'll say this: um, I've clowned McCall Bridges, called him mid Cal Bridges many times. Uh, he's been very impressive so far in Brooklyn. I still tend to feel like I don't know. There's something there that I just I, I just don't buy the like. McCall Bridges is a third option star type of dude. Like I, I don't well, know whether he I, is or not. Like, but but have a but chance of getting yeah. TikTok approved in Madison Square Garden. Yeah, like the the, the fact is like that we're that's not he's not going to be available for us. And uh, you know, I will I I would also throw this out there. Like, you know, Prez had an interesting kind of Twitter poll today, but it's like if the Knicks ended up with the eleventh pick, right? Would you trade that for like AJ Griffin? Or Tari Eason, or whatever. I'm, yeah, I wasn't really sure where he's going with that thing. I, I thought it was more how mad we would be if the Dallas pick rolls over. Um, no, I, I was, I was thinking, but like, I think it's like we talked about, like quickly, right? Last year, right? There were only Knicks fans were like, 
this kid needs to play more. If he plays more, he could be a star. Like there's star potential here. And it's also like, funny that a lot of the people that were like quickly can't get anywhere without a screen. We should trade him to get Jaden Ivy are now like, Oh my God, they signed Jalen Brunson. They killed quickly's development. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, it's just, it's just like that. So is there a guy like that that you could maybe acquire for a first round pick this off season? I don't know. I think that's kind of like an interesting thing to think about. Um, like I think it would be more like a Josh Hart type. Maybe. I I just think it's, I think it'd be interesting to think about that. Like, is there some wing who deserves more minutes, but isn't getting them because of unknown reasons? Well, I, I think the, I think the, the kind of the part, like we did get, like if Josh Hart was six, eight, it wouldn't have been a thing. Right. Um, <clears throat> you could maybe make a case for Kuzma. I'm going to throw this at you though. What if I told you there was a player who was six, nine, who could guard on the perimeter who's shooting 35% from three on 8.3 attempts per game, that was already on the Knicks roster uh, and might be the wing that we've wanted for a long time. Is that something you might be interested in? Um, I might be interested in that, but... Is um, Julius... Yeah. Are you doing an ad read or was it a but? No, 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 no. No, <laughs> not yet. Um, well, is Julius Randle the wing that was promised if I told you the Nick could get a four next to him who could shoot the three and protect the rim. Uh, I would be interested in that. Maybe somebody with experience playing at Madison Square Garden. Uh, uh, yes. So well, I think it's funny to bring up because uh, I am, for those who haven't figured it out, I am talking about Christoph Spurzingis. I think it's a little bit of an outside of the box thing. I think Jalen Brown is a guy a lot of people are talking about. You know, we've talked about it before. You have thought about solving this wing problem that way. And with Bendel's kind of the fact is Rand's not a good rim protector. Like he's not a defender at the four. He's never going to be. But he's pretty good on that. He has to do that full time. I don't know, but like when we play Tatum, when we play Kyle Leonard, there's off times when you feel like student arges out of the game, like, yeah, put Randall on them. Um and you know he's better at switching and moving laterally than he is backpedaling. I think somebody said today he's one of. I think it was Dallas and Miko was like he's the worst backpedal in the league. Well, put him in a position where he doesn't have to do that. And then you know as long as the guy next to him is willing to space, um, you know you. I mean, and you'd have Porzingis and Mitch is a hell of a lot of rim protection. Um, you get more shooting next to Randall than you have currently. Um, you know, I, I talked to Jeremy and he would basically have to get rid of like RJ and Obi to make this work. Um, and, and I also will add that like the Knicks are not in a position where they have to do experimental things like figure out if Randall next to Porzingis next to Mitch works. Um, but I also add all this, like if the Knicks keep their 11th pick, the reason why I really want them to keep their pick is there's a guy named Taylor Hendricks who's 6'9", but an elite shot blocker who shoots 40% from three. That's the kind of player that maybe one day can allow Tibbs to play Randall to five, which I think ultimately, like with this team, is something that somehow, like, it's not, it doesn't have to be a staple. I think the Knicks have two great bigs right now, but being able to go to that and like have a guy you can play next to Randall in the front court and unlock that is important. And KP would also, I think, allow Randall to play the three. Uh, so if you can get that guy, um, you know, I think that, um, I mean, I'm very curious about your thoughts on that. And maybe you don't think Randall can hold it at the three. Maybe you think the space would still be fucked. I don't know. But I know that you were a fan of bringing KP back, you know, if, if that allowed us to get off Randall last summer. Obviously, things have changed. But, uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and I will answer. But before I answer, ready for the underdogs, the upsets, and the unbelievable action from DraftKings Sportsbook. The biggest tournament in college basketball is here. Right now, new customers can bet just $5 on college hoops and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Plus, for a limited time, all customers can score a no-sweat bet during round one and two of the tournament. Go to the app, opt in, and place a no-sweat bet this weekend. If it doesn't hit, you'll get a bonus bet back up to $10. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and sign up with the code XXX. New customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Win or lose. Only a DraftKings Sportsbook with code XXX. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Um, yeah, I 
I'm a little bit apprehensive of this. I I don't think you can use Julius's defensive performance against like Kawhi or Tatum to to really be like maybe he's better suited to defending the three. I, I do think he is like when he's engaged, he's probably better suited. I actually I don't even think it matters what position he defends then. I like because when he's locked in, then this is the most frustrating part with Julius is like when he's locked in defensively. I genuinely think he's like an elite defender. Like he, he's, you can't really attack him in ISOs. Um, he's strong as fuck, so you, not many guys are going to be able to post him up. His wingspan is actually pretty underrated. I think it's actually like a seven two or seven three wingspan or it's something. Like seven foot. It's like yeah. It's not. It's not Draymond, but it's like it's fine for his. Yeah, size. it's fine. He's a good rebounder, obviously, when he's locked in. Like he, he's a fucking problem actually defensively when he's locked in. He's just not locked in all the time defensively. And like, it's obvious to me, like, you know, I mentioned this earlier, like I thought his defensive performance today was a joke, but like, we yeah, know that Jabari Smith Jr. We know, and we know Tari that he's in and yeah. yeah but we just know that Julius, when there's certain matchups, certain opponents, like he just it's doesn't, bonus, yeah. yeah, he thinks that they're beneath him. And so he just won't try. And the Rockets fit the bill. Um, and, so like you get these uneven performances from him, and I, I, it's not like every time he plays plays a star or an opposing star that his defense is tremendous or that his effort is fucking tremendous on defense. So I think it's a little bit dangerous to just be like put him at a three. I will say this though, um, if you got a guy like Porzingis, it you might like he's such a good rim protector, obviously rim turn. Um, if you had him and Mitch together, like what does that do for you? Um, and then if you have like IQ and Grimes at the point of attack, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I mean, Brunson obviously would be starting still, but like if you're going to move RJ to get Kristaps again, is that the scenario here that we're trading RJ to get Kristaps? I think you. I think to make the cap work, you would have to in some way, which probably isn't worth it because the durability versus a 22-year-old who hasn't really missed much time would be the deciding factor. But from a team fit perspective, I do think it's worth talking about. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting. I I do think Porzingis, his passing, playmaking, feel, whatever, has improved a lot since he's left New York. Um, I do. I think he's actually become a very good post-scorer. Um, there are still guys that can kind of push him around, but like he's definitely developed that part of his game. He's obviously shooting well from three again. Um, he'd be an interesting player to add. It's just like, I still just, I don't know, man. Like Randall Porzingis Mitch makes me feel like, I feel like there are matchups where you could just get run off the fucking floor. Um, that you got like, you're going to really be committed to this half court thing that we have already been very committed to. I'm not sure about it. Like I, I mean, I floated Porzingis last summer as a guy, like you know, but as a Lewis, replacement really. for Randall, right yeah, now. as a replacement for Randall, or like, you know, like <laughs> I, I think the more interesting consideration would be like, I think Mitch has been great. Obviously, <coughs> he's been tremendous for us this year. Um, but like, is it worth it to consider, like, if you can get Porzingis and you get, let's say, the deal would be like Mitch. For Mitch and Forney is expiring for like Porzingis or something. Um, and he, he, mind you, Porzingis is an unrestricted, he's probably gonna be an unrestricted free agent this summer. So we know how that works. Like with the league now, guys, if he wants to come to New York, they can figure something out. Um, and like, is it worth it to consider? Yeah, bring him in for Mitch. Um, would and, you give him something like three for 90? Or you know, it's, it's probably it's, if he opts out, it's probably gonna need to be something like that, right? So. It's it's so I, I I genuinely just have no clue. Like, because he's played sixty four games this year, um, so he's been pretty healthy. His splits are pretty fucking wild, man. He's shooting thirty eight point two percent from three, forty nine point four percent from the field, twenty three eight two point six assists. So like that passing is. I mean, he's not gonna be you know Jokic or anything, but that passing is picked up pretty nicely he's still a really good rim protector um it'd be an interesting one i, I just it's hard to feel gr great about his durability at the same time like mitch isn't necessarily iron man all the time either um it's just i don't know i i think 
I think if I, I need to really see what happens in the playoffs, I think before I could feel good about this one or the other, because I re, I do think, and I I mean this is why I think it's crazy to me that there aren't other teams that are seriously interested in him. Um, but like he, he's the him and Brooke are like the only two true stretch five guys in the league. And by true, I mean like they don't compromise your defensive integrity. Cat, right. Yeah. Oh, they, you're saying Cat would compromise your defense. Yeah, he, they don't compromise your defensive integrity and they can anchor your and they and they can anchor your defense um uh, while legitimately having the gravity to pull defenders out of the paint. Like, you can actually play five out, right? It, this isn't like, oh, we have Todd at the five and he takes a corner three every like other game or something. This is like a guy who shoots fucking volume. And the biggest thing with Porzingis too is he takes volume from above above the break, which is the toughest three. Like if yeah, you I mean, drunk- even even in New York, he could just walk in on the fast break as a trailer yeah. and just watch. Yeah, so, right? Like I mean, it's actually been pretty interesting to see him bounce back the way he has in Washington, um, which just lends even more credence to the idea, in my opinion, that Lucas suppresses talent around him. Um, but like that is like an extremely valuable player archetype. And, 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 and if Tibbs is going to be here, right. We know, what do we know? Right. He needs his center. His centers have to provide room protection. It's the one thing Porzingis like, like again, him and Brooke are the only two centers. I I think you could say this about, right. Legitimately stretch the floor and are legitimately. Oh, Jackson, but you don't. Oh yeah. But I, I still, the rebounding with him. I don't know. I think he's still four at the end of the day. Um, like maybe he he can he could become that. It took Porzingis a while, in my opinion, to become a good enough. Defensive he's still not rebounder. a great defensive rebounder. Right? He's not great, but he's a lot better. You can you can survive. Like if if Randall's there, like you can survive defensively on the glass with, with Porzingis <coughs> anchoring it. But those two guys are the only two to me that are like legit. Check the boxes off on both ends of the floor to be a true stretch five, right? But like the the health is a risk, and do you want to? sign him up for age 28, 29, 30, you know, that's what it is. And like, I, I don't know. I really don't know. And I, I worry about that. Obviously the, the health piece of it. And then you also got to consider just like, obviously his time here ended abruptly and not great fashion. He's, he's expressed a lot of kind of remorse, even I would say for how it ended. Um, I think I thought he showed like a lot of growth and maturity and kind of how he answered that question this year. Um, but like, is that tenable? Like, I mean, is Mr. Is fucking Dolan going to be cool with that? I have no idea. Like, I, I think there's, there are all kinds of things you need to answer, but, um, I mean, really to me, it's not like, would you move Julius to three? I just don't think that's realistic, but like, is it worth it to change your team dynamic a bit to bring him in as a stretch five? And I, I with the final piece I'll, I'll say is this. His usage is pretty high this year. Um, I'm not sure what it is off the top of my head, but I want to say it's like high 20s. Part of the reason he's playing better in Washington than he did in Dallas is he's doing a lot more than just spreading the floor, right? He gets actual shot creation, post touches, and shit like that. Like he he's not just standing outside beyond the beyond the arc to clear clear open the lane for Bradley Beal. It's 27.6 usage this year. I still think, like, let's say the Knicks did do this, right? They're like, you know what? We need more offensive juice. We want to have an option that opens up the paint even more um, because, you know, we think Brunson with a stretch five, this guy could be even at a higher level. Whatever the fuck their reasoning is, let's say they do want to get Porzingis. I don't think you can have him, Julius, Brunson, and RJ in the starting lineup. Like, somebody's going to have to sacrifice usage, a lot of usage, and that impacts their value to what they're providing for you on the floor. Like if you get Porzingis, I think in any scenario, assuming Brunson is untouchable, which he is, I would assume, uh, and Randall is not somebody they want to trade. RJ is a guy that would probably still need to go in, a, in such a scenario. So um, is that worth it? I don't know. I still think like with RJ, I, I still, I, he's fucking trying my patience for sure this year. Um, but I still think there's something there and I, I, I would not want to trade him for a guy like Kristaps who has dynamic. I mean, I just fucking talked about how unique he is. 
I just the concern with the health is just it's significant. And uh, one thing we know about this front office and this organization, at least under Leon Rose, is durability is definitely a thing they value. Hundred percent, that is a thing they value. Are you on the floor? Will you be on the floor? Or can I depend on you to be on the floor? Um, we know that Kristaps, yes, he and I, I, it's not just that he's played more games here. When I've watched Kristaps this year, he looks like he's got a lot more spring in his legs now. Like he looks. I don't want to say as athletic as he was before the ACL, but it's much better than whatever the fuck we saw in Dallas. Like his mobility is a lot better. Um, so it, it's, it's enticing, but I don't know. I still think like, I want to see, I, I want to give RJ until at least the trade deadline next year. I want to, I want to, I want to see if he can come back into training camp next year in a more uh, svelte uh, physical condition, a little more shredded uh, than he is right now. But like, I want to see that. I want to see how he looks. And then I want to see, um, you know, while I don't think the adjustment to playing off of Brunson and Randall is a particularly compelling reason for why he struggled as much as he has this year, I do think it is an adjustment of valid. And I do think like, yeah, maybe it, it does get better next year. You know, we've seen that with him and Randall, right? Like his first year, their first year together, we were like, what the fuck is this? And then their second year together, we were like, wow, this works really well. And then last year was like, what the fuck is going on? And this year it's like, Oh, well, maybe this works again. Like sometimes guys just need to figure it out together. So I'm still just not, if if I'm trading RJ, I really need it to be for like a top 15, 20 guy. And obviously I know it wouldn't be a straight up deal. You'd have to package picks and whatever, but I'm still like setting the bar pretty high for what I would be targeting in an RJ trade. I, I don't I know. Chris Tops is at that level. But I, I think the reason and Stretch four, stretch five, whatever, is an, a similar archetype. The reason I bring it up is like, you know, if the only real are, are upgrade for RJ's, you know, is like the Jalen Brown caliber wing, you know, you mentioned that is there a way for us to turn this first round pick or, you know, one of the picks we have into that kind of guy in a Josh Hart fashion? And I'm not so sure that we can do that. So, you know, I, I think for me, it's like, if you can believe Randall at the three, that opens up some more options, right? But it sounds like you don't believe that that's really uh, something like a bet worth making. Sorry, can you just say that again? Like, <laughs> yeah, what's, my what's point the is, bet? the bet would would be that you know our problem of we don't have a six eight six nine wing can be solved by making Randall that wing and and finding. You know, hell, if it's not KP, maybe it's someone like Dario Saric or whatever, right? But, um, but you know, is it easier to find KP and play that star as opposed to, you know, having to pay for a guy like Jim Brown or overpay for a guy like OG? You know, because it seems like that wing that might be the missing link for this roster always comes at a premium. Yeah, I mean... So if you could just make Randall that wing... If you're I just, not sold on RJ. So I, I still I think, think I, think I still think your like wing, you. I still think that guy needs to be a better ball handler than like one of the my, the main issues right now, I think, for RJ is his ball handling is still not at a high enough level. And like Randall, Randall is a plus ball handler at the four. And even then at the four, I think we see like instances where he has a high dribble and it can get sloppy and he's not the cleanest decision maker and that it can be problematic. I think you're you're walking a real fine line there. You put him at the three and you move RJ. It's still Grimes, presumably, in the starting lineup. Like Grimes would need to seriously develop as a ball handler for me to feel like that's worth it. And maybe he maybe he does. Maybe he will. I don't know. Um because Kristaps is not going to be doing much ball handling. Like he's I mean, he he can create offense, but he's not doing it off the bounce. You know what I mean? It's not dynamic like that. And then Mitch, obviously, we know, like, aside from one rejected dribble handoff every two months or something, he's not going to be creating much off the bounce. It just puts a lot on Brunson. Um, Randall goes from, like, 35% on volume from your four is good. 35% from your three on volume isn't that great. Obviously, Porzingis helps because he's in that, he's a lights-out shooter. Obviously, and then RJ hasn't shot the ball well this year, so I kind of get all that shit. But like, it just feels a little clunky to me. That's all I can say. Like, I, I don't, 
I don't hate it. I'm sure there will be people that listen to this that are like, what the fuck are you talking about, Stacey? Uh, I don't totally hate it. I do think it's like, and I do think it's worth it to consider trying things outside the box. Um, like, but I, I guess the best way to put it is this, right? One of the reasons, and I don't care that the the, Wolf, the Timberwolves are playing better right now. Like, one of the reasons I hated the Gobert trade is it was like, you did this trade without ever running a proof of concept, right? Like, you didn't have a proof of concept that Cat at the four with Rim Protector X at the five was a great long-term ceiling or was like some viable team construct um, that could lead to a championship. And then you go all in to get Rudy Gobert. Like, I don't love that. I think if you want to try this out, you need to run a proof of concept before you make a move that risky for Chris Stops. Um, that's that's probably where I land on it. Like, like you mentioned Taylor Hendricks, right? If you want to go fucking draft a guy that can presumably play the three and the four alongside Julius, go for it. I'm fine with that. Or if there's some low cost option in free agency, let's say like um, I don't know. Let's just say like like here here's an idea. Let's say Philly's just like you know fuck Tobias Harris. We're done with this shit. We don't even give a shit what we get for him. We just want to get off this contract, right? Let's say you just give him Fournier and you know whatever whatever other matching salary needs to happen for that. It's like Fournier and like fucking Rose. You have Rose opt in, right? Like that should be enough, and that's all. I'm not like obviously they would want more, but let's just say they live in a world where all they care about is getting expiring salary back. That might be like a thing I would consider because Tobias is a little bit more of a three four, right? Um, but like, I don't, I just don't love the idea of like Kristaps and Randall together at the three and the four and then Mitch at the five. I, I think it just feels like you're short athletically. I think you could get, again, I really think you could get exposed by teams that push the pace. Um, and the health obviously is a, is a risk. And then I don't really love giving up. I don't mean, I don't, not, I don't, I don't like giving up RJ for Porzingis. Like that fucking, is, and yeah, I, I ultimately that would push me towards not wanting to do it as well. And but. it's like, also like, I'm sorry. Like, I don't care if this is irrational, but like Chris ups had his fucking shot in New York and he fucked it up. So I'm not really interested in trading RJ for him. Like if there's a scenario where we can get Chris ups for, a bag of beans or something. I'm interested again. And I, I think like, I, I think Mitch has proven that he can be a, like a contributing player on a high level team if, and, and, and be a reason for its success. Um, but I do think like, it's fair to be like, yeah, maybe offensively you need to push for a higher ceiling or something. Sure. I get that. And I, I could see that, but like, I really would not want to trade either of those guys for, for Chris tops, just from like a pure fan perspective like i they i'm sorry they didn't fuck up their shot in new york they didn't push their way out that shit matters to me um so it's 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 interesting i i there's but like the you're right the player archetype that i am talking about though it's not that's the hardest one to find right like that that's why they tried to do it with cam right they tried like they 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 knew they needed that type of archetype obviously it didn't work out with cam um, but like, it's just, I still think you need to keep pushing for wings. Like it's so obvious to me that that's the one thing we lack. Um, and like, you look at the roster now, like our guard play is in the best position it's been in, in fucking years. I mean, I, we were talking about today in the, in the discord during the game, but like, I, I do, even though his offense is very up and down still, like, I think he's he's like already a rotation player. Like his defense is really that yeah. fucking good. Uh, well, and it's he like would, he would have started on this Houston team. Yeah, he probably he would. He'd fucking improve their defense too. And he's not an idiot like KPJ, so that helps. Um, but like if you like so our guard play, I mean Brunson quick deuce, that's great. Grimes, if you want to say Grimes, if you want to include Grimes as a wing, but it's like Grimes and RJ are the only wings we have. And as good as Grimes Hard. has been. Yeah, Hart too. Yeah, yeah. So true. So those three, like as good as Grimes and Hart have been, and even if I still have faith in RJ to bounce back, which I kind of do, um, like I still but think that, we need the, both. Two of those guys are six five. Right. You still need. A, you still need more on the wing. So like, to me, and you need like a bigger wing, right? You need a yeah. Six, yeah. Five. I mean, a guy that that might be interesting, um, is like 
and I, I honestly, I'm just throwing his name out there. I haven't even watched him fucking play at all this year, really. But like, if TJ Warren is available this summer, I think he's he's on a minimum deal with Phoenix. I don't even know how many games he's played this year. But like, he's a guy whose game I've always liked. Um, and I do think like when he's healthy, that guy he he can just score. He can give you fucking buckets. I mean, it looks like he's actually had a decent year. Um, can we now, tell him it's a pandemic? Yeah, right. Uh, he's averaged. He's only played 37 games this year, but shooting 50.2% from the field, 33.9% from three, and 79.4 from the line, 54.3 EFG. Um, he's I mean, 29. Just look- Is that related to the 37 games? or? Yeah, I mean, he's he's older, right? And he's bat- obviously got traded from Brooklyn or whatever. It's 56 true shooting for the year. Like, he'd be an interesting one just because I think you could probably get him for pretty cheap. So it's like, is that something you want to roll the dice on? Uh do you want to go bargain hunting again? Like the Knicks are, it's hard to make the Knicks better right now, which is kind of like why the frustration with RJ is so focused on RJ, right? Because it's like he's been the the one guy that you can really point at and be like, yeah, he's just not been good. I mean, you could say it with OB too this year, but OB plays like fucking 11 minutes a game. So who gives a shit? Um, with RJ, it's a little bit more. But like, anyway, not to turn this back into an RJ thing, I, I just think that, you, the, and you've talked about this, like this draft has the type of wings that I think the Knicks probably need. If they if that Dallas pick stays the Knicks, which I I would bet that it does, um, I just feel like they need they need to find somebody in this draft. They need to roster a rookie next year. I don't want to go two years without rostering a rookie. Um, Boston's kind of done that now for two years in a row, and I I think that might end up being a bit of a mistake. I know that they're they're really fucking good, but like Pritchard's probably gone after this year, right? Grant Williams, who knows if they pay him. All of a sudden, like they don't have any young talent in their pipeline, right? Because they traded Nesmith, um, and they traded Langford too already. So it's like all of a sudden your team went from being, oh my god, we're so young, we have so much upside, to like, you know, Jalen and Jason Tatum are entering their tw- like mid to late twenties now, and who knows if Jalen Brown wants to stay there? Brogdon is older. Um, you know, Marcus Smart isn't fucking super young anymore either, right? Robert Williams is young, but he's always injured. Al Horford is 7,000 years old. Like, you don't want to be in a position where all of a sudden one day, like, you don't have talent in the pipeline. And the Knicks have shown they can draft well, that they find value late in the drafts, that they can use picks to accumulate more future picks. Like, they have worked the board and all that stuff well. I do, th- I just think they need to roster a rookie next season. They have to. Um, I think it'd be a huge mistake not to, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I think that I agree with you on all of those things, but I think of late I've been thinking about, and let me throw this to you, you know, as we look forward, if this is a two, three-year process in terms of the Knicks trying to get the title contention, how much should, you know, whether it's five minutes a game, ten minutes a game, the option to go to Randall at the five, right? If there's somebody who can play like a, a normal role besides that, that's part of what intrigues me about Taylor Hendricks. I think the other part is that it's just tough to find players who can block shots and shoot threes, to your point, as you were talking about before. Um, but if there's a guy that can unlock Randall at the five, you know, how much do you think that would move the needle for the Knicks in a playoff series? How much would being able to use Randall at the five for 10 minutes a game? How much would that change things potentially for the Knicks? Not just in any given playoff series, but just having that ace and, you know, whatever, that that card in your pocket. How much does that change things for the Knicks if you're talking about them over the next two, three years at some point contending for a title? We haven't seen enough of it. Um, Not in New York, for sure. Not in New York. So it's this is just total speculation. I think it matters a lot because... I've seen enough where when the Knicks do go to that five out look and with Randall at the five, you put Brunson in that type of spacing, nobody can defend him. He can get to his spots whenever the fuck he wants. He just cooks teams and like it opens up the floor for RJ. I think quickly we do really fucking well in those lineups. Like I, I just think it's a dynamic that we haven't even really explored. And I do think that's one that if you have that come playoff time, um, just as like a, a curveball, right? Something that you can go to in certain situations um, and matchups. Like 
I think it matters a lot. Yeah, I, I do think that matters. And I, I would I, I think it's important to try to create a possibility to go to that. Um, like I, you know, we've shit on Tibbs a lot for not going to Randall at the five at all. But I will say to his in in fairness to him, the way OB has played this year has li- like I, I don't think he's been wrong not to try that out. And until they got heart, it's like, okay, so what's your version of going small here? You know, you're gonna have to play RJ at the four. And he's obviously not we just talked about like how he's had a very to be a, quite honest, a disappointing year. And it's like, well, Grimes can't play the four. It's just it's hard. There you can play like playing I, I hate calling it playing small because I don't think like that's really what it is. But you you still need to be able to do like like rebound. You still need some size on the floor. The Knicks just don't have a wing that is of that size to make that a little bit more viable. So I think it's important. And I do think like, you know, look, if Taylor Hendricks, if we we were fortunate enough to get this kid, I know nothing about him. Let's say he's everything you say he is. If we get him, is he going to be able to provide that in year one? Probably not. But if you're viewing this team as like a two or three year work in progress type of situation, maybe he is ready by year two. Maybe he's definitely ready by year three. Who knows? Like, look at where quickly is right. Like it's possible for young guys to develop and even on a winning team and, and help you win ball games and produce like we we've seen it quickly now for three years. So um, I, I do think it's important and I will still feel like looking at that in the draft is the best way to go about it. Yeah. We'll see if they get a pick. Um, I am very interested if they can't, if the pick doesn't roll over, you know, how they improve this roster this offseason. Uh, another guy that might be available um, is Jalen Brown. I know you're not the biggest fan of, of trading multiple picks. I don't think I am either. Let me th- let me start with this. He's a free agent after next season. Do you think there's like a non-zero possibility he makes it to unrestricted free agency? Uh, I feel like he's going to get traded this summer. That's and what I think. you don't think the Knicks should be in those sweepstakes? Um, Jalen Brown is a fucking weird one, man. Like when I watch him play, I'm like, he looks very good. But like, if you so okay, I'm gonna pull this up because I looked up I looked this up earlier this season, so I want to see what it's at right now. Um, he's not, he's not a guy who has particularly done well in his career when he's not on the floor with another better creator. Um, he's played with Jason Tatum, obviously his entire career. So, okay, here, here it is in 719 minutes this season without Jalen Brown or without Jason Tatum on the floor, uh, the Celtics at what Jalen Brown on the Celtics are a minus 4.01 net rating. Um, like they, they struggle when, when those two are not on the floor together. Um, but when Jason Tatum is on the floor with and Jalen Brown is off, they're a plus eleven point six four net rating. Um, like, I don't know. I mean, it's it's not Jalen Brown sucks or something, but I kind of feel like I, again, I just don't really trust him as a decision maker. He does a lot of stupid shit at the end of games. Um, he's a hell of a shot creator. He's really developed that, but like his his playmaking is pretty bad. He is a very Tibbs friendly type of offensive player i will say that like he he loves his iso tween has he crossover fucking mind perfect pull-up shooter right yeah i mean the the overall percentages aren't elite but a lot of it pull-ups right so yeah he's taking a a, a difficult uh shot diet yeah shot diet so like should the knicks be in it for jalen i don't know again like i don't even know how to answer these questions anymore because it's like anytime you talk about one of these fucking trades. It's like, oh, well, we got to give up three firsts and two swaps and fucking quickly to have to go in the deal. And it's like, why well, are we? I mean, well, if he has one year left on his deal, though, right? What is? How much does that bring down the price? Like, it should not be Donovan Mitchell level, right? Just it shouldn't this. be. It shouldn't be. But like, I, I just feel like anytime these guys get fucking traded now, it's always like that. Like, I, I mean, just could I, you get Jill and Brown for RJ Ob and like? one unprotected and maybe two of the protected picks. Would you do that? I think you'd, I think you'd have to do it, 
but I will also say that I think there's more risk in that trade than the common Waiting consensus. No, I, I think the common. I, I think I feel like if that trade, let's say that trade happens, it comes across the ticker, right? Oh, the next trade, exactly what you laid out. RJ, OB, let's say a 2025 unprotected first round pick and two of the protected picks. I think the consensus would be the Knicks, they crushed this trade. It's a great trade for the Knicks. I just think it carries a little bit more risk than that because, again, I just question Jalen Brown as a decision maker. Um, great shot maker, questionable decision maker. Uh, I don't, I don't love his passing at all. I think his defense is fucking really overrated. Uh, he falls asleep off ball all the fucking time. He's not a great rebounder. Um, he, he's, he's got, he has his moments on ball. Like, and I think that's what really pops when you watch him is the reputation he has defensively is because when he's on ball and he's fucking locked in, he can seriously fucking lo- like heat the ball up. It's a nightmare to get by him sometimes, but Overall, I think his defense is pretty, at best, I would say, average. Um, but, like, you know. But he gives you that shot creation. He gives you, as average as his defense might be, he gives you someone who can match up with some guys that a Quinn Grimes or a Josh Hart can't, right, because of that length. He'd help and you he in transition. You that, and, he help, and he gives you that third shot creator that the Knicks don't have. <laughs> Which I think we've talked about this, and you know, as much as it sounds like we're both intrigued by like, the idea of maybe I don't want to say money balling it, but more Josh Hart trades. The reality is they probably are going to need to add a third shot creator at some point. Obviously, a guy like Levine creates too many deficiencies on defense, so that's Brown, where he would give you that at least minimum threshold level of defense while giving you that third, you know, star level shot creator. Right. And if that comes without giving anything, RJ would be a big loss. But if you still have quickly Hart, Grimes, Mitch, you know, you've you've improved your roster pretty significantly. Maybe I mean, do you think that that roster, right? So if your starting lineup is Bronson, Grimes, Jalen Brown, Randall, and Mitch, and then off the bench you have quickly um um so Hart would be in the starting lineup. So you'd need to add some. So it'd be something like quickly deuce, uh, I guess, um, whoever you sign at the four and Hartenstein. <clears throat> do you think that lineup is significantly better or do you think that's a contender? <coughs> with with Jalen Brown, you're saying? Yeah. So you're replacing RJ yeah. and OB in the lineup. I, I think Brown. I think you're you're very close. I don't know if I because we're still, very but are we not very close right now? I want, I need to see, I need, I still got a lot of questions. Like Julius has answered all the regular season questions. Um, I need to see him in the playoffs. I need, like, I, I'm telling you, man, the last month with him has been a little iffy. Uh, he's just some, some worry. A lot of it has been with Brunson out. I do think with Brunson in, he's, you know, and even tonight with him deferring to quickly, I thought, I don't think it was a coincidence. It's it's easier when it's, when it's, but it's easier when it's when it's rolling. I mean, as as a wise man once said, attitude reflect leadership, Captain. Um, <laughs> but like his, he's just so fucking volatile. He really is. Like I just need to see him in the playoffs do it. I think he can. Like to your point, the you know some of the stylistic changes he's made offensively are important. But I can't say that for sure. And I'd be lying to you if I said I had complete confidence in him. Um, but let's let's say let's say Julius is solid in the playoffs. D- does Jalen Brown get you there? Um, I mean, it would weaken one of your rivals. It, yeah, it, so you're weakening. I mean, that's that's the one really good part of this is you're directly hurting Boston, probably unless 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 RJ bounces back, which is possible. Um, like, but. I would say I would say it's probably a safe bet that at least next season you're hurting them. Um taking J like having them replace R- Jalen Brown with RJ. Uh I will like again, like I I think if I was Leon Rose and that trade came across and I like that's that was on the table for me, I think you have to pull the trigger, even with all of my concerns about Jalen Brown and you know, you're gonna have to pay him after next year and all that shit. Like, I think you kind of have to roll the dice there. 
but I don't think it's insane if they turned it down. Like, I, if if they're they've been disciplined, and, and and like, think of it this way, right? They Donovan Mitchell is a guy we know they wanted. They coveted Donovan Mitchell, and they drew their line in the sand and were like, "We're not going past two unprotected picks. We'll give you RJ." And whatever we can, we don't need to rehash the whole Donovan Mitchell trade talk thing. But like, they had a line in the sand and they stuck to it, even though everybody fucking knew that was a guy that they wanted, right? Everybody knew that. Like, he was one of the guys that when Leon Rose got hired, it was like, this is a dude that trust me, they fucking really want this guy. Um. So, what, what my point is is like, we know that. Let's say they love Jalen Brown, right? Even if they love Jalen Brown they might make the determination that at a certain price, it's just not worth it. And look, I'm not saying this because, again, as I said, like, to me, when I watch him, I'm like, whatever my concerns are about him, I think he's probably like a top 25, 30 player. Um, you could probably bump up higher. Some people would. But I'm just comfortable saying he's top 25, 30 player. If you look at a lot of his impact metrics, the impact markers don't love him. They never have. Um, because he doesn't pass the ball very well. Uh, his He's become a more efficient scorer, but he takes a lot of, like you mentioned, a lot of really tough shots. His shot selection isn't great, which can kind of hurt a team's offense. Like there, there's stuff out there that's like, he's very, you know, he, the, the numbers, the raw numbers that he puts up, his box score numbers may overvalue how good or how impactful he is. I don't really have a, like, clear thought on that because I one I fucking hate the Celtics. Um but two, it's just like I see both sides of it. Like I do think that he's like again, I don't trust his decision making. But then you also watch some of like when he gets hot, like you'll have quarters, right? Where you're just like, the fuck did this guy just score 22 points on like six pull up threes? Like what the hell are we doing? This is insane. Um he has stretches where he just gets super hot like that. And the Knicks could use a third guy that can do that. Um so it's it's one of those where I think you almost kind of have to roll the dice. I mean, not that this would happen. I think he ends up staying, but like Chris Middleton's also an unrestricted free agent potentially this summer. He could opt out. Um, I know he's a little older, but like that's a guy where like you know, if you think yeah, if guy. you think he moves you into a contender level, I mean that's that's a guy that's worth. I mean, and it, it fits the same profile, right? Shot creation. It's a little bit of a different style than than Jalen Brown. He's a Brown. way better playmaker. I like you can trust him in the end of games. To but make he, good you decisions. do need him to slow the. You need him to like he needs to slow the ball down, right? Middleton. He's less of yeah. He's less of a grab and go or a, you know you're 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 really looking at between him and Brunson. You're looking at two very efficient scorers, but two guys who both need to slow the ball down a little bit to um you know to really be as effective. He's a good spot up guy though. That's true. But so is Brunson. Uh, yeah, but, Brunson like, is but but you're you're you know, in terms of that connective flow, he's not going to transform that. And and that is I think something Brunson does have a little bit of an advantage over him, just because the athleticism and the off ball and, and you know playing in that system. But but it's worth noting that Middleton has played off of Giannis, so you know, he doesn't need maybe does maybe I'm over exaggerating how much he needs to be that um you know, back down guy. But I will say, yeah, I think the playmaking is a very good point. The other question is though, why would Middleton ever leave? <laughs> I mean, it it he, right. That's obviously you know, there's no clear cut reason why you do that. But sometimes guys just want a different challenge, right? Like that happens all the time. Guys just, hey, I I won in Milwaukee. I, I've made all my money. I want to I want to go try and win in New York. I want to prove that you know I carried Giannis. Giannis didn't carry me. As uh, opposed to just winning rings next to Giannis. Yeah, writing but, a book about you, him and then having his you, ex-wife date Giannis's son. Yes, exactly like that. Um, but you also like have to live in Milwaukee, which sucks. So, yeah. yeah and again, one day your ex-wife might date Giannis's son, and then <laughs> she might want to change her name to that. And that all your crazy. angry biographies might not pick up for it. That's a crazy headline. I mean, the other thing too, like. I don't know, man. I, I just think this team, like, I know Grimes has had a little bit of a struggle. He has picked it up lately, and it was nice to see him get rolling in the second half. I thought he actually had a really nice all-around game today. Uh, 14 points on 12 shots, 9 rebounds, 6 assists, 
two steals. I thought he was a lot better in the second half. I yeah, his like defense the in the second half yeah. was in yeah. the first half. For his defense in the second half was awesome. And then he just, you know, he finally got a couple of threes to fall and then it just opened it up. For, He's up been for solid him. for some time. Yeah. yeah. I and I just like, again, like, are we sure that we need to be in a rush to do And And this is kind of where I've just fallen on the entire RJ thing where it's like, I think it's insane that there are people who are trying to argue that he's not had a bad season, but at the same time, like, and as disappointed as I am in his performance this year, I'm still not in a rush to deal him, and I'm not in a rush to deal that's, him for like that's fair, but like an OG and an OB have, type, or like like even even like the Jalen Brown. Like, I just want to see, like, I think there's more there with Grimes, right? Then, and, and I think there's I think most people of, do. I think the Knicks front office does, but. Here's the thing. If they're the five seed this year, if they flirt with 50 wins, it seems a little bit, you know, especially if the Dallas pick doesn't convey, but even if it does, like this isn't a front office that relies on or necessarily assumes that a rookie is going to help them. Um, you know, it's it seems a little bit counterintuitive to say they would just run it back when they have, you know, a 28 and a 26-year-old, 25, you know, and whatever – on efficient numbers, one of them all NBA, the other one probably deserving of all star. It just, I mean, is that common for front offices in those situations to rest on the laurels? Like, I'm sure, like, it's not that they won't do anything, I'm sure they'll probably extend quickly, they'll re sign Hart, but, um, you know, it seems, I and mean, maybe they would look at Hart as their free agent acquisition and see how that. Looks for a few. For, for, for is it is it know. fair to say that general roster construction to win a title requires that you have one guy who's at least around top ten in the league? That is what it has required so far since the Pistons. I mean, and in just general NBA history, like yeah, we can point out you know weird examples here or there, but like generally speaking, you need at least yeah. a guy of that caliber, right? Do you think Jalen Brown is of that caliber? No, but I also think that. No, no, just hold, just hold on. Just, I want to no. do that. Do you think Brunson is? No. Do you think Randall is? No, Brunson is to me actually of the three. I think Brown is the closest to get there. Brunson, like if he was three inches taller, or four, if he was four inches taller, I'd he'd have. be an MVP candidate. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like he, he wouldn't be, be this shitty team. on defense. Yeah, that's also part of um, it. Okay, so what I think needs to be considered then is like if your assumption is as a team which i I mean i don't know if the knicks believe this or not but the general consensus is like you need that type of guy (coughs) if you need that type of guy does making a trade that gets you closer but but leaves you short of assets to potentially land that caliber of player down the line does that make sense it's possible it does it's possible it does because like if you think like well, Jalen Brown is better than what we have. And once, you know, this pick goes out, then we'll have our full set of picks again. And we're going to keep Jalen Brown. And then maybe Jalen Brown plus picks gets us to that level of guy that we ultimately need. Um, like it's all like that. That's all definitely possible. There's no question to me, like at all, that it's possible to operate in that sense. I just think that's kind of how you would need to, to view it in a way. Well, I because... think that what is, I think that the other idea is that, you know, if you have Jill and if you have three guys who are maybe top 20 or top 25 and you supplement them with like an elite bench, how, like there haven't been a whole lot of teams that have been able to do that either. Right. Um, and then the other thing is like, if you think about, well, you need a t- like, cause I don't know that, getting stuck on, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but I'm saying that the idea that you need an MVP candidate, well, look at the teams that have those guys or have gotten those guys and won a championship, right? The Warriors draft, the Warriors had one guy like that. They drafted him. Um, the Heat were able to sign theirs in free agency, but, um, you know, that is the, the opportunities for that appear to be drying up. Um, the Milwaukee Bucks, they, they have that guy. They signed him. Um, you know, the, um, the Celtics might have that guy. They drafted him. The, the Sixers might have that guy. They drafted him. So unless you tank, it's very like they the record of getting those kind of guys is pretty low. And for the teams that have done that, you do have to mortgage everything and it doesn't end up working out. Um, I think every team that KD has been on since, uh, since 
Golden State. Okay, so <laughs> really KD on the net kind of um, exposes that. But a lot of these super teams do. So if you can, the the thing with a Jalen Brown versus uh you know like a Luca type player. I'm not saying Luke. I don't want to get into that. Um, we can if you want, but um, but you know that type right where it's just you know scorched earth. You're you're giving up everything. The benefit was if you keep quickly, if you keep Hart, maybe you can keep RJ. I don't know. Um, but you you keep those guys. You keep your depth. Um, you don't burn all your picks you still have some picks um you know it, it, like if if it's something like um like even the Mavs, they got kp but they still had some maneuverability because they left, kept their picks now they did stupid shit on top of that but that that wasn't really pushing all their ships in um for that matter like if atlanta had only done the Dejounte murray trade that wouldn't have had to be pushing all your ships in um and if you have enough of those guys and you also have depth can you break that rule I think that's worth asking because, you know, you can say that no team has won a championship, you know, besides very few exceptions without that MVP level player. But it's also like, yeah, but how, like, you know, if you get to the certain point where you have three all NBA players, even if none of them is that star, okay, but how many teams have actually three all NBA players? You can mention the Hawks, I guess, but like, that was a little bit of a circular thing because. I know people thought Paul Millsap was a top twenty player in the league. You know, I mean, those players. legendary battles that uh, <laughs> who, who can forget the legendary showdowns that LeBron had with uh, Paul Millsap and, <laughs> and Al Horford. Uh, um, oh my God, he made it to seventeen finals in a row. Yeah, all right, wouldn't do it in this Eastern Conference. Uh, I had to get my LeBron slander off there, um, but like, no, I, I see. So this is this is the thing is I actually kind of agree with this. I, I've I think we've talked about this before, but like my theory is that you might not actually need like a top 10 guy anymore to make it, to be a contender. Like the way I think of it is I, I mean, we, we talked about this last year. I didn't think Tatum was a top 10 guy last year. I thought he was, he got a lot better, but I didn't think he was a top 10 guy. They almost got to the final. They got to the finals and they almost won. You know, they were up what two one. Like they, I think in a lot of ways you ask most people, like they had the better roster. They had more talent. Obviously, Steph Curry goes God mode, and that's that's all she wrote. And like, so that's the counter to the idea of like, well, you don't. It, it's both ways, but they got to the finals. They're right there in the mix. I thought the same thing with Phoenix the year before. I didn't think Paul was a top ten guy that year. I didn't think Booker was a top ten guy that year. I didn't. I will never think DeAndre Aiden was a top ten guy. But like they, they were up. You know, two zero. They nearly. They they were right there. They're on the cusp. Like obviously, then Giannis goes crazy, and it's like that's the counter. Like maybe you do still need that guy, but you're seeing these teams get there, and I do think because of how debilitating these trades are that we're seeing around the league. Like, I mean, it's hard to be willing to stomach that cost at times for certain players, and um, like if you overpay, you see like there are repercussions to that too, right? Like we've seen it with Atlanta, right? With Dejounte Murray, they've overpaid to make that trade. And look at where they are. They haven't materially improved their team. Um, and um, yeah, like I, I do think it's, I really think it's fascinating. I think it's pretty interesting. Like I, I, I'm not sure what the right answer is because like my gut is like, you probably still will always need that type of like singular MVP type of guy on your team. But can, but, can are the Knicks in a position to get that guy without drafting him? And be in a title position. I That's think there's like, always a chance to get that guy without drafting him. If you're okay, in New York. you can get him without drafting him, but then are you scorched earth at that point? Like, That's are, what it feels if like. you, I, I would, I know Jimmy Butler's older. I know that contract is huge. He's a guy that I think, you know, if if he went to Riley and was like, "Look, dude, I can't carry this fucking, you know, this old ass roster." Your like, team just, needs a hero, not a Butler. Yeah, but it's like like he's a guy that I even though he's older and all that stuff like he's like I I think the best way to put it is this. He is the worst player that I think is good enough to be the best player in a championship team. It's so like are, him, is, him is and the, Booker. Is the follow up from that then that like you're better off waiting for a guy maybe in his 30s who would be cheaper but for one and maybe for one or two years could give you that window? I think there's always opportunities for these guys to move. Like we look, it's hard to see it 
in real time. Like when we're sitting here talking about it and it's like, well, who the fuck is going to, you know, Mitchell just got traded and KD just got traded. Like all these guys just got traded. There, nobody's going to move for a while. It's the NBA. Somebody will always become available because it always happens. It always happens. Um, like, and, and the, the price of these players and what they cost, it can change. And, you know, look, the argument for Jalen Brown, right. That you mentioned, like, is it worth it to trade for him if you think you have a shot at him in free agency the next year? I don't know. I, I really don't know the answer to that question because every time we do this, the Knicks end up not signing the guy that like they ideally wanted. Um, shout out Jalen Brunson, though, breaking the trend. But like, it's just like, I, it's it's a very hard thing to answer. And um, I just, my gut is just like, Sometimes the best move is just to not do anything, and it can be really hard to make that decision. It's the hard. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is to do nothing, right? It's very hard to do nothing. Um, the easy, the easy thing is sometimes to just make a fucking move. Like the easy thing for Atlanta last year was just to trade for Dejounte Murray. See, we got Trey Young help. We got an All Star guard. This is fucking wonderful. Um, was that worth it? Yeah, and, and you want to avoid. The, I mean. Atlanta was on the cusp a couple of years ago where the Knicks might be. Who knows? Yeah. I don't, I don't think we're too far from where Atlanta was. Um, and so to your point, maybe that would be the biggest danger is to, to really sacrifice what's here. I just think that considering, you know, Boston is only going to get better. Their best two players are young. We'll see what happens with Brown, but they're only going to get better. Milwaukee's not going anywhere. I don't um, know, man. I, I think Boston is uh, one my gut is that they blew their best chance last year. Um, and two, I'm not, I don't love some of the longevity of what this roster is like Brogdon and smart and Derek white. Do you need all three smart looks fucking creaky to me this year? Like he's not moving as well as he, as he has at his best. Um, Brogdon's obviously had a great year in terms of, um, you know, he's stayed injury free. He's been really good for them off the bench, even though he's not the best six man in the league that goes to Emmanuel quickly. Um, but like, you know, Horford's fucking 70. He, he's shooting great this year, but he's obviously to me defensively, not the same player he was. Um, it's nice that whatever steroids he was on last year, uh, you know, they, I guess they ran out. Uh, and then Robert Williams is like, can you depend on that guy? And I don't know, like it just to me, the the depth they had last year feels like it's not there anymore. Probably because I don't think Grant Williams or Peyton Pritchard are staying. I so think is your, but but you know, so on the other on the other side, Wemba Nyama is probably going to come to the East if he goes to Orlando. Like, yeah, then you're we, fucked. Well, because Orlando, <laughs> like they're twenty six and twenty three, their last forty nine games. Uh, they beat the Knicks. I was annoyed by that. But like, yeah, I, didn't think, like I, I, I didn't think it was a it. people were going crazy. Like that that was not They're I was annoyed team. because it's like the Knicks are a better team than them this year, so they should win that game. But like the, the, the to your point, like the magic are much better than their record looks on the surface. And they've been playing like that for a while. Yeah, and yeah. and the last game going. we played against them was fucking tough too. Like it wasn't like we just went down there and fucking ran rough shot over they them. They beat that us was, two out of three times yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, so like they're and they're been playing above 500 ball for more than half the season now. Um, you know, they're a team. I don't, I think Detroit is still multiple years away, but who knows? Maybe I don't know if women Yama is a year one changer. I think specifically on the magic though, with, I think Paolo is going to take a leap. So at some point, whether that's next year, or the year after, um, you know, Cleveland has a guy that could take a leap too. Um, you know, so it's t- it, it is just um, you know, are the are the Knicks in a position where they can ride this out? I don't know, and it's not. I'm not talking New York media stuff. I'm not talking about you know like win now stuff. I'm just talking about in general as a sports franchise. This situation has been tough to navigate. Uh, the last team I can think of that was kind of like this was the actually the the Nets. Uh, you know, when they got off all those shitty contracts. You know, they had Dinwiddie, they had D'Lo, they had that team. Not, not, it's not a one-to-one comparison, but they had a fun young team with a lot of good contracts, good players, uh, you know, excessive picks, and they turned that into their all-in move. Uh, maybe that was too far to one extreme. It's, it's an interesting place to be in, and it feels like a place that 
teams usually will go one way or the other from there. It doesn't seem like teams will stay in this place. The team that stayed in that place, I guess, is Toronto. You know, so our, our Lowry and DeRozan, you know, our, our Brunson and Randall are Lowry and DeRozan. I don't know. Um, I kind of think they might be. I and then we ride it out be. until until our Kawhi comes. But it's like, that's what... One, I would say that, like, we've shown that we can find value in the draft. And, like, I trust... Walt Perrin. I think he's got an eye for talent, obviously, going back to his time in Utah. And, like, we can talk about quickly, quickly, obviously, had the fucking awesome game today. But, like, you know, to bring it back to Grimes, like, if you think Grimes is capable of more, right? Let, let's say let's say the Knicks have seen enough from RJ where they're like, we think he's a good player, but ultimately we, we don't think he's going to be a long-term piece of this team. We'd like to get somebody a little bit more stable. Let's say they just trade, like, I, I'm, I'm just talking out loud here. Let's say they just trade him for fucking OG Ananobi, right? Let's say that's the trade. If like, is it possible that Grimes can develop into your like that third guy? Like, I I don't know because we haven't had really seen it for an extended period of time. But in the games this year, when he's had to like increase his usage, I don't think it's been all that bad. It's actually kind of encouraging, and the and he's definitely improved off the bounce from year one to where he is now. Right, like attacking closeouts and shit. Like he's way better at that now. And I think you can see like the passing pops at times right off the screen, like some of the passes he's able to make. I think there's more there with him and the Knicks clearly do too, right? That's all the, what all the reporting was around the Mitchell trade. If they believe in him, like, are we sure that their logic in making any moves this summer isn't to open up opportunities for him? I think that might be part of it. And that, yeah, that but could I mean, be, by the that same could be why before, but I'm saying that, that could be, be a top 10 player. Who knows? Grimes. I don't know. Like, well, I, I mean, the odds are no, because most players will never not be top 10 players. But like, if you think if you is, is Grimes getting to Jalen Brown level crazy? I don't think that's crazy. I really don't. I, I don't think, think that's most crazy. Most people would. Most people would, but most people also would probably have said Jalen Brown becoming whatever the fuck he's become in his second year in the league. They would have been like, you know, you're fucking crazy. Like. I think there's stuff there with Grimes that kind of reminds me of Jalen in the sense of like, I remember watching Jalen back then and I didn't, I, I didn't believe in him as a player, but like you could tell that there was like a little bit more there with him in terms of shot creation offensively, but he didn't get opportunities to really show it because, you know, they had Kyrie, they had Gordon Hayward, they had Tatum, they had all these fucking guys. Like we don't really see, like, I don't know what, Grimes looks like if he goes into games and it's like you're going to get 18 shots today no matter what. I'd like to see that. I would like to see it. Or at least I'd be intrigued to see is a better way of putting it. Which is why like I I wonder. I really do wonder. We like, I think it's safe to say the Knicks were interested in OG and Anobi. Uh, they did make an offer. Three protected first for him. Like presumably, this is again, this is my assumption, I would assume if they were still interested in OG Ananobi, that would be to replace RJ Barrett in the starting lineup. Like, isn't the natural beneficiary of that Grimes? And wouldn't that indicate that they maybe have, they do think that the upside with Grimes is higher than consensus? Like, they I also I, for hard. So they're hedging their bets a little bit, but. But Hart, I think it's like we it was I mean, we talk about this, I, I I know we just talked about Deuce like, probably as a rotation player, but like he was the we like his issues offensively were hurting the bench group as a as a collective another, group. Another thing I noticed today is quickly was not hesitant to pass out to Randall or Grimes or even RJ. There were a couple of times he looked off a wide open heart for three. So I wonder if that <laughs> Well, because but I no, like, I know, one, I know, I know. that's the wrong play. I'm not excusing like quickly should make that pass, but also if Hart is going to pump fake out of a million threes, I wonder if that plays into the players' minds, right? So, um, I mean that the, the answer is Hart is a good shooter. Like he needs to just not do that shit. But you know, um, it would be concerning if that was affecting things. I mean, I, a, a one play that was really funny today was when they passed it to Hart in the corner. 
and then he like dribbled in and then threw the ball underneath to Hartenstein underneath the rim. And Mike, Mike was like, Oh, like Josh Hart had an open three, but look at how unselfish he is. And I'm like, Mike, I don't think he wanted to shoot that three though. I don't think it was I don't know why, but he's not a bad shooter. You know, like, like he's, it, it like it really does remind me of Pablo Prigioni, like where you know it's like Paul, it, maybe it's like Draymond, <laughs> but Draymond's actually ass or like Draymond three pointers. It's like or maybe it's like, like he Frank. was randomly wasn't he a couple years at one point? He was like forty two percent for one year, but I don't know what the volume was. And also like it was like it was. <laughs> Think about this, right? When you play with guys who draw a ton of attention, you're going to get open shots, right? This is what precipitated a certain well-known sportscaster who I've been told this week was never loud and sensational. But a certain sportscaster once said, with the fate of the of humanity on the line, if you had a choice between Steph Curry and Andre Iguodala, give me Iguodala. I want Iguodala. Because Iguodala yeah. never misses an open shot. Why is every shot he has open was a question that, was beyond answering. Um, so, yeah. But I think Hart is more than that. I've seen him take a lot of contested shots and hit them at a pretty decent rate, and his form looks fine. Maybe he's released a tad slow, so it's really puzzling to me that he doesn't shoot more. He used to shoot, too. That's the weirdest thing about it. Like He shot at a decent volume when he first was in L.A. I'm just looking it up right now. So, like, his first year, his, his time in L.A., okay, he averaged, uh, he took 5.4 three point attempts per game his first year in New Orleans. That was his third year in the NBA when he was 24. He took 4.1 and 3.1 his first two years in the NBA, uh, in LA. Like the guy can shoot more than he has. I don't know what the hell happened to him. Um, and in Portland last year, when he first got traded, he took 6.4 per game. He was hitting I know like he was playing seven percent too. Right? Yeah, so it's just like I don't know. It's a very weird. And when thing. he came to like the first two games of the Knicks, he was just like Tibbs said, "Green light." He said, "I have the green light now." Um, I would imagine eventually it'll work itself out, and he will shoot more. But um, in the in the short term, it's a little frustrating because I feel like he can shoot. So, yeah, no, I I, I definitely think it's frustrating. And like, look, I, the Grimes thing. I'm not like totally like, yeah, is he going to be a top ten player? No, he's probably not going to be a top ten player. But like. I don't know what the Knicks think internally because the Knicks seem to believe like more in their talent than consensus. Like I think they were higher on, I mean, they were probably higher on quickly than anybody else was this summer. And they were obviously higher on him in the draft than anybody else was. Um, well, at least Wes was. Yeah. And like <coughs> we've, I thought it was interesting this year, Fred Katz, who no longer has his Twitter, which is, a fucking hilarious subplot. Um, the cat's like out he, of the bag. Yeah, he tweeted something. He mentioned this in one of his articles, I believe, though, where like he said that uh, the Knicks, like they had no interest in moving Deuce McBride at the at the trade deadline. Which, like, I don't think it's like. I mean, I get that. I think that's normal. But it's also well, like, it wasn't like, oh, would you take LeBron for Deuce McBride? Probably, yeah, like, I mean, within reason. For seconds or yeah, like, they weren't interested in just trading him. Like the way I read read that is like they weren't interested in including him in a trade of like the one they made for Josh Hart, right? Like yeah, that was like not going to have just put him in the sweet place. Right. right. So I think there's like, and, and we know that they, apparently they set the price really high for Obi, which is why Obi didn't get traded at the deadline. So we like know that they value their guys and they, and they, and they really believe in their ability to evaluate talent. We already talked about with Grimes last year during the Donovan Mitchell trade talks. So like, it, it's not outrageous to me that they, would consider like opening up opportunities for Grimes to them may they may view that as a path to acquiring a third star because they believe in Grimes that much. I think that's possible. Yeah. Um we'll see. I mean I I, I think I still think that I still think that if you I think the two pathways like the, the the main pathway is you need that MVP level player, which they don't have. And I think that as much as they might be high on the guys they've drafted, I think believing in any of them to be, like, I mean, if you look at the archetypes of these players, like the difference between Grimes and Jalen Brown is that Jalen Brown is six seven. Like that's not an insignificant difference. Grimes is always going to be undersized, and he's not a nuclear athlete. 
So you're basically talking about Grimes becoming Bradley Beal, but even he's not an MVP level player. Um, there is one player with Quickly's dimensionality. Okay, so two players with Quickly's dimensionality that have become that level of player. That's Dame and Steph. Um, he doesn't have the athleticism of Dame. He doesn't, as great of a shooter he is, he is, he is, he doesn't have that shooting ability. And I don't think any amount of defense makes up for that. I think he's going to be a, I think quickly going to be a top 20 player in terms of getting to the MVP level. I don't think the Knicks are deluding themselves into that. And I think you can say that about every player. So your two pathways then are, do we tank? That's not something they can do. Do we try to trade for that player? Well, that's going to deplete our depth. And we also have to hope that the player isn't a complete fucking asshole. Um, and so that's tough. And the other one is like, okay, well, without getting that player, how stacked can we make this? And no, it's a different sport, but there's, you know, there was a study done that showed that, you know, in, in the European soccer leagues, you know, teams were best off giving as much money to their top three players and then making sure the rest of the money, the roster didn't make as much, right? So can you win with a couple of uh, tier two players or uh, three tier two players or four tier two players? It didn't work for those Hawks with Al Horford and Paul Millsap. But, I would know, say our offensive talent is way better than what they had, though, which is exactly. very important when you're discussing and, that. And, and we pair that with, I think, a pretty elite defensive player and a couple of really good defensive role players. Like, yeah, like if we are so high on the depth and the balance of this Knicks team, why would we not think that a guy like Jalen Brown could push on the top? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's more like if they think Grimes has a leap in him, then is it more worthwhile to target a guy more in line like an OG and OB who doesn't do have think, the... Do you, think, do you think guys like Brock Eller bet on leaps? Yeah. Even with... I don't know that they do. That's the point. I think they like to have the upside of the leaps. They like the convexity of that. But I don't think they're going to bet That's on That's the fucking nerdiest on. shit you've ever said on here. What, convex? The Bro, convexity said, of that. Okay, I think people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? like, I'm, sure they, okay. I'm sure Low they do. downside, high upside. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe. I, it's, I think they've definitely baked in a leap with quickly like i think they believe that that was coming um not earlier this year like it seemed like there were some truth to the trade rumors i don't so does... think i don't think there was ever much truth to it to be completely honest i think they got I mean, the lay lift. sources that i think both of us know i don't have sources <laughs> let me say that people that both of us know have reported that there was serious consideration that that was going to happen and then he had kind of the stretch in december um that kind of I made mean, them but like i think they were their... getting i think they were getting a lay of the land like i don't see a problem with that i don't i i would be lying to you if i would said i think they never considered it but i also think that they 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 think there's more they thought there was more there and i i feel the same exact way about grimes like i think but that's different from them thinking like this is a potential all-star i think that like i think that they kind of did that with grimes though i mean may, maybe not all-star this year but I feel like the reason they didn't want to include him in a Mitchell trade talks, they're twofold. One is just in terms of the player archetype baseline that he comes in with. He makes a lot of sense next to Mitchell and Brunson, even though he's not the biggest guy in the world, right? That's part of it. And then I think the second part of it is they think there's more juice there um, than consensus. Like I, I thought this when they drafted him, and I'm saying this admittedly like, not knowing very much at all about that draft class, just knowing like what Prez, I think you and Prez, I think Prez really liked Grimes for that. I don't, I don't think you like Grimes as much, but I know Prez did. Um, and I remember talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Prez loved the three point volume. Yeah. I yeah. wasn't, um, I deuce was my favorite pick of that draft. So, yeah. I mean, the thing I liked about Grimes though, just after watching him initially, it was, I was like, I think like because of his release, his, cause his release is so high. And I was just like, I feel like they might think that he's got three level scoring potential. And I and like he wasn't a good finisher in college, but I remember watching him and I'm like, this guy feels like he's pretty athletic and he should be a better finisher than he is. He, he does a good job of using his body too. 
Like he gets yeah. his body, so he gets the line a fair amount for those. Um, which is, um, you know, if the Knicks don't get a guy like Taylor Hendricks, the other guy I think they should consider is a guy named Jordan Hawkins, who looks a lot like Grimes. He's also not a very good finisher, but when he gets there, he gets the line a lot because, you know, they can kind of, and you saw that a couple of times today, Grimes just kind of got his body in the guys. Um, and I think also guys bracing themselves for that contact opens up his passing lane. So, yeah. And I just, I just remember watching him and I'm like, I think there's more, I think they, they think that there's a three level score potentially in here. And I still think I, that, I, that, that still seems like a, like, I think they could think that there's a guy who can attack closeouts, but the shiftiness has never really been there. The, you know, like he's got decent burst, but um, you know, I, I think like, I'm just saying like, because of how level headed this front office seems and because of the kind of player, they don't, they don't take massive upside swings. They tend to find guys who have a very easy role with some upside, but like that floor does seem to be the primary thing. So like, I don't think they're viewing these guys as like, like they might really value Grimes. I don't know that they view him as a potential all-star. Typically. So I, I would, I think it's, I think they take guys with high floors who's, who they believe have potential to be high ceiling guys. Like, the pull-up shooting thing to me is the key because that is like the biggest skill for perimeter players. If you have pull-up shooting ability off the bounce, that opens up everything and that gives you a higher ceiling, which is like, that's why the leap quickly is made inside the arc. Like the, he could get into the paint, right? But it's like, he just didn't know what the fuck to do when he was inside the paint when, as a rookie or as a sophomore or a second year player, right? Like he struggled with that because he just didn't have enough skill like to to benefit from that. But he could open up those opportunities for himself because of the pull-up shooting ability. And Grimes hasn't shown that yet. Um I'm actually a little bit annoyed that he like doesn't take more pull-ups, but I I mean it's just hard with Yeah, but that whole transfer can be take time to Yeah, 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 exactly. So like I just I think they view upside very differently than other than than a lot of teams anyway. It seems like I don't think age age clearly does not scare them off. Um, I think they just value certain skill sets very, very highly. And and one thing I believe quite strongly, uh, I think all of the guys that they've picked have graded out well in terms of like plus minus EPM on off shit um, in college. And then when they've gone to the league, like I know Obi has not a great year this year, but his first few years, he was a pretty solid EPM guy. Uh, quickly, we know Grimes has also been very impactful. Deuce has been pretty impactful, even despite all his fucking <laughs> Jekyll and Hyde shooting performances. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, I, I would they, t- like, again, like these, these things are all interesting to me, but I, I kind of wonder, like, if they just would rather get a guy like OG than a guy like Jalen Brown because of perceived cost and, next contract and how he fits in with what's already there. I do wonder that I I could be wrong. I mean, Jalen Brown's a hell of a player, so it wouldn't surprise me if they preferred him, but OJ and Obi as boring as he is to me. Um, he, right. He, so if you actually think that Jalen Brown puts some more of this up, does OG and an Obi? And I, think I don't think OG Jalen, does. I don't think OG yeah, does. Think Brown but I'm not might. sure Jalen. I think Jalen Brown could. I don't know if he would. I, I'm not. So I, I think that 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 is a, like the bet to me isn't would we rather get Jalen Brown or OG and Anobi. The bet to me is would we rather get Jalen Brown or you know Joel Embiid or wait for things to really implode in Dallas, right? And we don't need to get in that conversation. I know you have your reservations about Luca, but that level of talent, right? Um, can you get to the top without making that trade? by getting someone like a Jalen Brown. I think that's the more, that's the debate really, not the OG and an OB debate. If you're doing OG and an OB, that's, that's like a glorified J- Josh Hart trade. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, a more expensive version of the Josh Hart trade. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Uh, all right. I think that's a good place to end it. Um, Stacy, let the people know where they can find you and uh, plug anything you'd like to plug. Uh, you can find me at Stacy Patton eighty nine. Uh, I will plug. Oh, I'll plug um, the big board that was dropped by Chris Persianen today with um, 
with our friend Zach uh, doing the, the graphic. It's actually a really nice graphic. Um, and, um, you know, while you guys may have been worried, uh, the Mavs won today and the Clippers are currently blowing out the Bulls. So uh, when we wake up tomorrow morning, the 11th pick will officially be the Mavericks, which means it's going to the Knicks. So the draft is still relevant, uh, and there's a lot of pro- content coming out of the Strickland. So uh, definitely be sure to check that out as well. Yeah, uh, I'm going to plug all of the uh, wonderful work of the Strickland, uh, all the stuff that Prez has put out, and um, you know, podcasts, all that shit. The Rundown. Uh, Sam, Tyrese, and Jeff are doing a great job with that. Uh, and I will also just plug uh, Manuel quickly, doing doing great things. Pause. Uh, yes, uh, doing great things for the New York Knickerbockers. It's great to see. All right, that is our pod for today. Hope everybody has a great week, and I will see you on Friday. <laughs>